We want to welcome everybody tonight to the committee of the whole meeting. First, uh, call this order to oh, call this meeting to order. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Mary Kay, roll call, please. Dr. Dave Bardo. Here. Trina Borneman. Here. Dr. Noel Deep. Jill Maddock Nelson. Here. Kristen Matt Miller. Here. Andy Mary. Here. Danny Pyatt. Here. Angie Schreiber. Here. JD Schrader. Here. Okay, moving along to the public comment to permit fair and orderly public expression. The board will provide a period of public participation at every regular board meeting. Uh, the office, the presiding officer of each board meeting will uh, administer the rules for the board and for the public for the public participation. They are as follows. Public participation shall be permitted before the board takes official action on any issue of substance. All attendees must register their intention. And there's a book up here. If you haven't signed in and you wish to speak, come on up and sign uh, the book. Participants must be recognized by the presiding officer. Uh, each statement that is made by a participant shall be limited to five minutes duration, and Dr. Sprague will have the clock going. No participant can speak more than once on the same topic unless others who wish to speak on that topic have been heard. Participants shall direct all their comments to the board and not to the staff or other participants. That's just some basic groundwork for our public comment. Do we have anybody that signed up? Andy? Yeah. Okay, we have, first of all, Carol Bardo. We'll check one one second. Dustin, is that on? Okay. Yes. I just have to request of information. I won't read them in detail, but the first one is concerning the ICS equity and audit. I would like some more information on that, including time spent for that project and training. And the second is just information I would like on some administrative staff, and that's detailed in each one of them. I would like this information by the 20th of May. Thank you. Okay, we don't have <clears throat> any other persons that have signed up to participate. First of all, I just want to say thank you to Mr. Rogers and the high school staff, as well as Mr. Leiterman and his staff for getting this room, as well as Dustin and the IT staff for getting this room available and ready for us to come and invade the high school room. Some of you have been in this room before for board meetings in the past, and it's kind of tight up here. There was a huge desk that is against the wall that used to be out a little farther. They moved that desk, and they've uh, added cameras, and uh, they've done a lot of changing up here. So if we can give Mr. Rogers and his staff, Mr. Leiterman and his staff, and Mr. Racine and the IT department a hand of appreciation, thanking them for having this all ready. I know it was a lot of uh, hurried up work, so thanks so much. Uh, somebody also in the community presented me with a, an opportunity that if people want to be educated on uh, uh, critical race theory, there is a conference uh, over in Roth, Rothschild, uh, Tuesday, May the 17th. And the question that I would have is if there is board members that want to go, uh, if we have more than, a, more than three board members that go, I need to know by Friday so that way Mary Kay can post uh, because we would all be in the same place at the same time. Obviously, no discussion of board uh, school matters. But if you want to go, that's Tuesday, May the 17th at 6.30. The doors open at 6 o'clock. 
uh, Dr. Duke Pesta, and I may be saying his name wrong. Uh, he's the one that is um, uh, presenting over there this coming Tuesday. Did I say that right? Oh, Cedar Creek at the at the Central Wisconsin Expo Center at Cedar Creek, um, Market Street in Rothschild. I think most everybody knows where that's at. But if you don't, there's a flyer up here that somebody handed to me that you can see the address. Okay. Uh, moving right along to new business. Letter A, board meeting, uh, board member meeting, legislative report. One thing to announce out is... Um, we will have a board development tool follow-up on Thursday, May the 26th, and that will take place at the Anago Middle School IMC from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And this is a follow-up on the recent survey that the board has just done. So uh, please mark your calendars, board members, and those who want to be a part of and uh, see the board development going on. Okay, are there any, anybody have any information about the legislative report? Danny, I'd just like to say that uh, at the last meeting, I mentioned the Excellence in Teaching Program at CISA, and we just had a presentation last week there. And so that presentation is attached to, uh, to board docs there. And uh, I'll just go over a couple of the highlights. Uh, the program started in 2017. It had uh, seven students at that time um, for the last five years, we've had a total of 113 students and 40 of those are this year. So really we kind of hit the peak here and uh, it's debatable if we want to get bigger at doing that. Uh, there's 31 areas of, of licensure. Um, of the 40 students that are participating this year, uh, all but two are on a licensure of stipulation, meaning they're actually teaching uh, this year. Um, if you look on slide 11, you'll notice that some students are um, come from the southwest part of the state, and that is because one year we had a, um, an agreement with CISA 3 and worked with them to have that program, but we don't do that program anymore with them. And in uh, 2023, in January of 2023, we'll start a 316 uh, reading certificate program. Um, and we're also working on a pathway to licensure for those that have an associate degree. And I think the rest of it's all pretty uh, clear-cut in that presentation, so I won't take any longer. Good. Andy, has there been anything else that's come out of the CISA 9 that you want to report on to us? Um... No, I mean, Al Battery will start as the uh, administrator in July 1st, and uh, to replace him, he was in charge of the Excellence in Teaching program and also uh, the professional development here that comes to our district, and um, I forget her name, uh, but we've hired the uh, director of instruction from LASA to take his place. Okay. When are your meetings up there? At, at the CC? Uh, they're usually the first Wednesday of the month. First Wednesday, okay. All right. Does anybody else have anything? Any other legislative report? You'll see attached hot off the press today the strategic planning invitation. This one is obviously for the board, which is why it's attached. But if anyone has interest, we'll be in touch with you um, to form like a focus group to lead this work. So the dates are in there. Like I said, I met with Lori Miller just today to solidify this. Um, so what you're seeing is the first blush and then the meeting is over a month away yet the inaugural meeting and that will be here in the IMC. So more to come. Okay, any questions about that strategic planning invitation? Okay, hearing no questions, we'll keep her moving right to uh, Mr. Prunty and the budget update. Dustin, if I could have you pull up that document, that first attached document, and let's go to the budget planning document.
Okay, this is a document the board has seen for the last several months. <coughs> and um, just a couple things that I'd like to note on the document. If you look at um, the administrative recommendation as well as the board approved column, you can see that um, I've moved over support staff. We've got that settled. I've moved that over as a, a board approved item. And then we did the insurance renewal and I'm anticipating a savings of about $200,000. Um, at this point in the budget cycle, I'm getting ready to tie the ends of the budget together so that in June we present, I present a very preliminary budget because it's based on enrollment numbers that are just projections at this point. Um, everything about the preliminary budget is just an estimate. So um, if you look further down and we're in the administrative recommendation column, you can see there's a couple items there that are changed, and one of them that's changed this time is the personnel budget. And to balance where we are in, in the calendar, I'm saying we could reduce the, um, the extra that I have in the personnel budget, and I have that in there for um, benefit selection and how we hire teachers, and you know, at, at this point in time, we have a lot of positions open, so that's a really vague number. But I'm saying to balance the budget, I think we should be reducing the personnel budget and um, so on and so forth. And you can see that uh, the other items that I'm recommending. And um, unless the board has objections, I'd like to go ahead because these, at this point, because personnel is such a large portion and we have a number of positions open, I need to get the budget, uh, a preliminary budget developed. So I'm recommending that we take um, next year's contribution to the HRA fund for a teacher retiree uh, benefit out of forfeitures. I'm recommending that we um, eliminate the remodeling budget um, out of the general fund and we use um, ESSER $3 to fund that for the next two years. Mark Coutts is working very hard with the Emergency Connect funds with um, Universal Services, it's USAC is the name of the company, it's the, the E-rate program, and we've been notified that we're getting another third round of E-rate, or of um, Emergency Connect Fund um, grant for over $200,000, so I'm recommending we take that out of the general fund. And um, prior to settling administrative increases for next year, um, at this point, I'm presenting to the board a, a potentially balanced budget. And I'd like to go ahead and do that then for June. Then um, the, the other attachment that I've included in the budget is to give the board a sense of what goes on in the business office from now till the end of July. And um, we do accrual accounting. So essentially what we're saying is we incur the revenues and expenses for a given school year within a school year. An example of that would be um, July tax receipts. We typically will get this year's um, tax revenues in, sometime in August, and we put those on receivables for this current school year. Likewise, we um, also look at payroll, and we pay our teachers in July, and their benefits run through August. So we are... Um, accruing those expenses back to the current school year. Likewise, we look at um, all of our grants and make sure our grants aren't overspent. Um, and if they are, we go ahead and um, have to back those out and charge them to the, to the general fund. Um, a big um, portion of my time um, between now and the end of the audit would be working with Heidi to look at something called maintenance of effort. And part of our local support for the special education department we are required by the federal government to maintain that. So we are constantly reviewing that towards in, in July, in June and July. And um, since we're required, if we don't meet it, we actually have to reimburse the Department of Education, the federal government. So we're going to pay it regardless. So we're looking at those numbers, and we may be adjusting expenses accordingly. And then um, lastly, I've got on the board, just so you know, we've got a preliminary audit scheduled the first part of July, and then our full audit the, the last week of July. So those, those are the weeks that we leave you alone in the, in the office, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, does anybody have any questions for Tim regarding the budget development planning or the year in closeout procedures? Okay, hearing no questions, we'll move on to item C under new business Skills USA National Competition presentation. Skills USA is a nationwide club that values uh, individual personal skills, technical skills, and workplace skills. We just go and compete in lots of competitions in pretty much any competition or career field that you can think of, honestly. <laughs> so I myself go for first base CPR medical, and through that, I was able to go to state and compete, which was my first time going up there and experience something like professionalism I saw, not only from the contestants, but the judges as well, was outstanding. And so through that state competition, I qualified for nationals in, in June down in Atlanta, Georgia. And we are hoping that I can go and represent Wisconsin as a whole in the first base CPR program. I don't know if you all heard that McKenzie won the state competition for CPR certification, correct? So she's going to be going and competing in nationals in Atlanta, Georgia. I think we need to are representing Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Sorry, she's going to be representing Wisconsin in Atlanta, Georgia. I think we need to give her a round of applause. Congratulations on your accomplishments. That's awesome. And great presentation. Do you know how many students from uh, Wisconsin go to the national competition? I'm not 100% sure. I know it is beyond over 100. 100. Um, I'm not sure about the Thank you and good luck. Thank you. McKenzie, we're very proud of you. And as you know, board members will be looking under action items, uh, talking about that trip. And McKenzie, you will represent Anago Red Robins well in uh, Atlanta, I'm sure. Okay, letter D, Scotchman Ironworker Quotes. Mr. Parizic, you want to come on down and <laughs> he can come and join you. Yeah. <laughs> Mike knows more about this thing than I do. So you'll see attached on the board doc, there's a couple of different quotes for a Scotchman iron worker. Um, basically, when I started working here, we had an iron worker shear here in the shop. Um, it was deemed unsafe, um, so we had to get rid of it. And since I've been here, I've been updating the metal shop, tech head department. Um, so this machine is actually part of the Department of Workforce Development grant, 200% um, match that the district has to come up with. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but we were awarded that $50,000 grant that um, 
I applied for. So we're going to start moving that forward. So attached, we have three quotes. Um, the one that I guess I would recommend going with is the one from Machine Tool and Equipment in Wausau because they have an extra 2% um, discount on there. We've worked with Randy and those guys there before. They're in Wausau. They can service our equipment on a regular basis. But this machine has pretty much all the bells and whistles, all the safety features on it. Um, not only can we shear material, but we can punch material, bend material. Um, and basically, it's a state-of-the-art piece of equipment that our students would see out in the field that they would be using once they leave here and go out into the workforce. So I guess if you have any questions for me, I mean, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I guess I have a question. Yeah. When you say going out into the workforce, do you, do we have any kind of partnership deals going on with like the area manufacturers that will act, will actually be using this tool? Yeah, so Waukesha Bearings, I got a couple students going to work out there. Ace Equipment, we're hoping to get a few students working over there. Um, Agri Industries over in Merrill, they have three of these machines in their building over there. Um, so there's quite a few partners that donate stuff to us on a regular basis, help us with maintenance things. Um, that's kind of why we went with this machine because it was recommended by not only our business partners but also North Central Technical College that offers our two-year diploma for the manufacturing program. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Should this go through the board for approval, I'd like to see a demonstration see what the machine can do and I, I don't know if anybody else on the board would be interested but absolutely we'd love to have you i like that kind of stuff cool. when when the company came and gave us a demonstration in, in a truck outside I, I came with mike out there and it can punch through you know three quarter inch steel like that and just the amount of time and energy that would save in terms of saws off blades and student time I think we should give Mike a round of applause too for applying for that grant and all the different donations that he's able to secure mm -hmm. throughout the community. He is a huge asset and money saver for our district and he's really preparing these kids well for the trade. So I think we should give Mr. Breeze a round Absolutely. of applause. I like this because it's another tool, no pun intended, that will help students to go, uh, those students to go right from graduation into the work field right here in some of our businesses in Anago and adjacent communities. So thanks, uh, Mr. Prezik, for doing that. And I should have kept you down here uh, for the next item is a wheel balancer quote. We don't want the wheels to fall off, so we want to balance them. That, that wheel balancer um, is something that uh, Mr. Churchill is working on, and I know Mr. Prezik is aware of it too because that CTE team really works well together. Um, but that's an, uh, an updated piece of machinery that is, again, going to prepare our kids for out in the real world, and they're using some state-of-the-art stuff that that wheel balancer provides that we don't have right now. Um, our other machine was donated years ago, and that technology has long since passed. I don't know, Mike, you want to talk about anything else? No, well, essentially that's it. It's just time to update some of our older technologies uh, to keep our kids engaged and wanting to go into the field. If we tra train them on a piece of equipment that's 30 years old, and they go over to Brickner's or Parsons, and they have to balance a tire, it's not even close to doing the same thing. So that's kind of why we're looking at updating some of the things. Um, our department's been working on a five-year department plan, trying to plan for the future, and uh, eventually we're going to share that with all of you um, to kind of show you what we need in the future going forward because there's lots of updates that are needed um, to get our stuff up to speed, I guess you would say. So, again, it's just an update to things that we currently have that are not meeting industry standards.
Was this too also um, an item that you have found grants for to? This one I did not uh, find grants for. I believe we were taking some of the funds out of, was it the? I can answer that one. Yes. <laughs> Tag teaming. So, so we have some unallocated capital equipment funds yet for this school year, so we're gonna try to do it as a year end purchase. Okay. Any other questions regarding? Just, just one note, Mr. Pyatt, that yes. anything CTE related, career and technical education related, can apply towards the grant that Mr. Friedman wrote for. Okay. So this uh, fourteen or 15000 can apply to that. The lighting upgrade and the portion of that can apply to it. So it's not just specifically the metal shop. It's Okay. How many students do we have going through that program a year? Just ballpark. Sorry. I see over 100 a year through the metal shop. Um, we have five different areas, so several hundred students come through our site. Thank you. And that has grown over the last few years, correct? Yeah. yeah. Numbers have been going up. Good. Does the community use it a lot, or? So every Thursday night, we're open to the public in our fab lab area, mm -hmm. and we use our shop as an extension of the fab lab, so occasionally people come in, they'll design something on the computer lab in the fab lab for like our CNC plasma cutter, CNC wood router, and then we'll go over to the shop to utilize it with the schools to cut out those projects. Okay. Blake. Is that something that's heavily utilized through the community, or is it just sparsely, people here and there? Yeah, here and there. Uh, okay. Last week, we had about 15 people in using the fab lab, but it's kind of hit or miss. depends what the weather's doing and what else is going on, but we try to run different workshops and things where it's hit or miss. Christmas time, it's extremely busy, because people come in and make different gifts, sharing experience and things like that, so it's all kind of dependent on what's going on. Is that open during the summer, too, when the school is closed? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move uh, right along to item number F, the food service update, equipment purchase. And Ms. DeBoer will be telling us what new equipment. Hi. Um, well, the equipment purchases, uh, I didn't get three bids yet. So those will probably come and see you all in June to okay. spend some money. So, I haven't met a lot of you. I'm Sarah Dubor. I'm the school nutrition director. And just wanted to tell you about our school food service. And um, then we'll also talk a little bit about the equipment too. So as far as our school nutrition department, it is self-supporting. Uh, we have 18 employees and um, three subs that fill our school positions. Uh, we have very dedicated employees. Lots of our employees have been uh, with the district for 20 and 30 plus years. Wow. Um, our high school and middle school uh, are both production kitchens. Uh, our high school staff also prepares meals for all three of our elementary schools. Um, our revenue is generated from breakfast, lunch, and a la carte food and beverage sales. Kind of why I'm nervous. I've seen all you guys before. So <laughs> <laughs> You're doing <laughs> the fine. Microphone to so true. Um, and most of our um, generated money for our meal sales comes from the U.S. Department of Ag. Um, last school year, um, our meals were mostly funded through the U.S. Department of Ag with uh, the Summer Food Service Program, and they reimburse at a higher rate. So that's been last year and this year. So we do have an excess fund balance this year, and that's why I was going to come to you with some equipment sales. And with those, we're looking at purchasing uh, a merchandiser at the high school. 
And typically, when I've been looking, they're anywhere from $16,000 up to $20,000. So once I have three bids, I'll come back and see you guys. And another um, item that we're looking at purchasing is a coffee oven. And this oven, it steams and does convection cooking and regular cooking. And it's something to upgrade um, an appliance at the middle school. As, as far as our budget, um, with our 150, it is an excess. And whenever it's an excess, that means that we have more than three months of operating budget. So we do a spend down plan to DPI, and ours has been approved for this year. Some of the plans for um, our budget spend down are, again, the equipment. Um, if we go back to regular school breakfast program and national school lunch program, um, I would like to go back to breakfast for free for our 4K through 7th grade. That's what we used to do, and that helps also. Um, I also anticipate that a lot of our funds will be used um, with purchasing food and equipment because everything is going up. Lots of food from last year is already up 20% from what it was. Um, we've also kind of changed the way that we provide food for the students. We're using different packaging and um, sometimes when equipment doesn't work we have to use more paper and supplies like that too. I also wanted to talk about um, bad debt. As far as bad debt, with Fund 50, we can't write that off. So typically, um, Tim and I meet together in June, and we look at like the senior accounts, and we see students that still owe money. And from there, we write those off. And that gets paid out of the general fund. Do you have any questions? If you do, you can also email me. Where are we at with uh, bad debt for this year with the it's school lunch? It's very low. It's very low. Good. Is that a norm? Is it normally very low? Not always. Um, it depends <coughs> upon um, who we, the past two years' lunch and breakfast have been free. Sure. Yeah. So the students haven't generated a lot of debt with lunch. Even though we do have a cutoff policy um, of $20 negative, lots of times the students that are more affected are our younger stu students where we don't really kind of cut them off as soon because it's kind of hard to refuse food to little guys. So I'm glad that we're not generates. refusing I know food. That generates our debt. So. Okay. On the equipment that you're purchasing, uh, you said a merchandiser? Yes. Could you just tell me what a merchandiser uh, is? With the merch it's a refrigerated unit and um, it's open to air although we close it up at night. Uh, we, have, we have one right now, and it's in our um, line one. It has our salads in it where we keep them cold and good packaging. And what we're looking at is um, adding another one for, like, our sandwiches and our fruit, and then we'll kind of put in, like, a little, uh, like, kiosk kind of with where we have our chips and other kind of things that don't need refrigeration to kind of make that almost more of a self-service line. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just like to make two points for clarification. The first one is Sarah is struggling to get vendors to bid on equipment. So it's not like she hasn't tried to get quotes. And I, and I think it would be nice if we, whatever she has before the next board meeting, she brings forward with a recommendation. And then we can get it ordered in the order place so that it's, it's here in August or September with the start of school. Um, the second point is she, she touched on this... Um, because of some of the additional funds we've gotten from um, during COVID relief, um, DPI has very strict um, standards. And we're right now, we have a fund balance that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about $800,000. And in her department run is completely, like she said, self-supported. Um, she pays for all of her uh, employees' benefits, labor, all the food, everything. <coughs> and um, DPI is um, requiring us to maybe do no more than a quarter's worth of operating expenses. So because it's from the um, Ag Department A, she has to spend down. And every quarter she'll have to report what her fund balance is until she gets below that, that one quarter of her bills. 
it's okay because it's hard when your budget are conscious still. <laughs> What's the barrier with getting quotes back, do you think? Um, I don't know if it's also has to do with not, not having people in offices because um, I've been trying to contact um, a company that makes a water heater for one of our dish machines and I, the company that makes it, I've called them twice, I've talked to receptionists, they've transferred me, I've even gone online and put in a request and nobody's gotten a hold of me. Uh, finally, we were able to get strike equipment to get a quote for this, but uh, Parks Town, we couldn't get it. There's other places that just don't carry hard like that anymore. Because, um, well, in that instance. So, but the other part of it is sometimes parts, they're for refrigerators or parts for ovens that just aren't here because they're overseas and haven't been shipped mm -hmm. and all the COVID stuff. Yeah, thank you. So Tim, when um, you said we're like plus 800,000, where, do, where does the federal government want us to be at? No more than one quarter of our total expenses for a given quarter. So, so a prox. Um, 250,000, 300,000. And it, and it really has to be where, um, because of our free and reduced lunch rate, our reimbursement for the last two years is substantially higher than mm -hmm. our budget. Mm -hmm. So technically, we have to spend about 500000 Yes. Okay. Just wanted to, that's what I wanted to get to so that everybody heard what we have to spend. Right. Thank you. Does your financial year, is it a little bit different? Like the summer school money, where does that go? Because that'll be extra too, right? Yeah. What they go on is our fund balance from last year. Oh, okay. So I do a report every summer that has to be submitted by August 29th. It's our annual fiscal report. And from there, they look at um, all of our revenue and all of our expenses, and it's broken up between breakfast, lunch, a la carte, um, any kind of equipment, um, maintenance, all those sort of things that, that we use for each one of those meals. And then that's submitted, and that's where what has happened and how much we spent. I imagine this year's is probably going to look different just because we did spend a lot of money. But also with having free meals, we have more kids eating. So that's nice too, because even at the high school, we have lots of days, 63% of our kids eating. When I first started, we only had 48. So there are more students eating. There, there is a need for the kids for food. And um, at our elementaries, uh, it's about 75% and same at the middle school that are having meals every day. So the 75% that are having meals every day, that's what's eating the school's food that's provided? Mm -hmm. So the other 25% apparently in the elementary are okay. packing a lunch. Or they're not at school, kind of going into our gotcha. numbers. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. What was the percentage prior to COVID? Do you know offhand of students at a lunch at any level? At the elementary, it was probably about 85%. Okay. Middle school was about 70%, and high school was, we were getting close to 50. Oh, wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ms. DeBoer? I think it's very reasonable for us, Tim, to put that item for the equipment on the agenda for May the 24th uh, for an action item. So uh, hopefully you can get some vendors out there that will, <laughs> one, one's the start. Uh, maybe we'll find a couple more that we can compare apples to apples to and, and move that forward. Because then it's a time issue of getting it here. Right. Uh, so we want to, yeah, let's do that. No other questions? Thank you so much. Okay, item G, uh, we will have Mr. Leiderman come up and give us a overview of the summer maintenance projects. Okay, so most of this, uh, some of you have been here for, but uh, the new board members haven't, so I just kind of want to give a recap of um, the larger projects that the board has approved over the years, or over this year. Um, you know, we have uh, the Nabok and Epoxy floor that's going to be done this summer. We have um, the middle school asbestos abatement that's flooring and then the replacement for that so we have some of it epoxy um, and then some of it is going to be BC compiled that we're going to do in-house as part of that. Um, at the middle school we have uh, two sections of the roof repair um, or replacement rather. Um, 
and then along with that, there's some brick repair that needs to be done. Um, just some maintenance things that the you know building that's one hundred ninety years old needs. Um, bricks are deteriorating a little bit. And we got to take care of that. Um, we have the LED upgrade here at the high school. That's every light fixture inside the building and outside the building. Um, and then we have a uh, filter replacement project at the aquatic center. Um, you know, all all in total on that is. Uh, Summer it seems longer to everybody, but for me and my staff and my world, June, July. Um, the minutes really count down fast. Um, so that's a lot of work to, to fit in there. Um, you know, it's a mix of a lot of donated funds, um, fund 46, and then fund 10. So um, those are the bigger projects. One that I wanted to to talk to you about tonight, and I'll bring back when I get final expectations is, um, for those of you that were here, you may remember when I presented on the roof project, some of the materials I could not guarantee a price in because the manufacturers simply would not allow me to lock in. They said, you can't lock in on purchase. You can't lock in on manufacturing. You will lock in when we ship it. And that's just the terms, or you will not get product. So I did get a call last week from our roofer, and he said that that is going up. So I talked with him on how we need to uh, have that documented so I can present that to you. Um, very similar to those of you that remember the track project last mm -hmm. year. So we'll have uh, the vendor provide the, the justification from their suppliers. It's not just them saying that they're raising the price. It's the actual process of manufacturing those ingredients. I will bring that to you when I get the numbers. So okay. I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on that one. Um, you know, on top, of, on top of that, my staff does endless small projects all year round. You know, we have partners moving here. So we got two classrooms here that have um, either small facelift or a very large facelift on one of them. You know, they do that stuff in house. Um, I mentioned the flooring that they do in house. Um, they have a number of miscellaneous cabinet projects and things like that that they, they take on painting. Um, and then on top of that, just all the normal maintenance work that we do in the summer with the floor care, um, preventative maintenance on air handling systems, things of that nature. Um, yeah, I could ramble on for a while, but the biggest thing is I just wanted to give you an overview on the, the amount of money that we are able this year to, to put in the project, which is very, very much appreciated. Um, and then give you a heads up on that as well. So, anybody have any questions? I just want to say thank you so much for doing the patches in the uh, in the parking lot. They're not fully done yet. They they brought one full truck over. Right now, they don't have hot mix and anti so they have to go to Maritime County to get it. Okay. Um, they brought one full truck over and burned through that, and we'll probably get another full truck. So sure. Hopefully next week. So. And, and I realize that that's just a, a band aid on on the, the bigger issue, but for right now, thank you so much. Yep. That was really bad. <laughs> really, really cool. bad. So yes. yes, thank you. I think we could lose a small car in some of those potholes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They're bad. And I, I don't know why. Yes. Talk to me even like the concrete guys around town in the county in, in the city um, for whatever reason this winter was bad on hard surface whether it's concrete or asphalt or whatever the, those rains that mm -hmm. season rains that we got and that late rain in December it, it really made stuff blow up mm -hmm. so Jake I was looking at that cease to 10 report from 2014 yep. I know that's that's pretty dated, but I saw a notice on there. It's had something to do with the roof here at the high school. Have we addressed any of those issues the, the roof for the was, roof here? Was replaced. The last section was uh, 2015, I believe. Okay. Tim had done that in stages, and I came on as the last stages being completed. So. Okay. 
the rough here is the home we've done, and we have a good warranty left on that. Okay, good. Any other questions from board members for Mr. Leiderman? No? Thank you so much. Okay, moving to item number H, the 4K partner agreement with All Saints Catholic Schools. Mrs. Doms. Hello, good evening. So attached, you'll see an agreement that we've had for quite a few years now with um, All Saints Catholic School. We share the enrollment then with them, so we provide them some dollars for each of their students, but we count them as our students. And uh, we also provide some, a small amount of supplies and resources for their classroom. We provide some support for their teachers and curriculum. Um, full disclosure, the last year they have struggled to find a certified teacher, but now we're in process of having someone who's been subbing and will be um, licensed next year back in the 4K classroom at All Saints. So this is a pretty, the standard agreement that we've had the last few years. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any questions. Hearing no questions, thank you so very much. We'll move this along to the board meeting at the end of the month. Moving to item number I, discipline procedure discussion. Uh, let me just wrap this up with a little, um, hopefully it's a cute little bow by the time I get done saying what I want to say. <clears throat> This is, uh, this is something that I had uh, asked Mary Kay to put on the agenda because it was asked for by uh, a few of the board members to put on. And this is, as, as I met with Julie Thursday, Thursday, as we talked Thursday, this is not a moment of the board is trying to go from their 30,000 foot level to the ground level where the teachers and the principals and the administration are. Uh, this is just a 30,000 foot view from the board level to say what can we do because we know that there are issues with discipline. We know that there are issues with consistency uh, throughout the district. So what can we do to support our teachers, number one, and then what can our board do, number two, to support our principal administration, and three, obviously, our Door Street administration. What the board needs to keep in mind, uh, to, especially to all of our new members, is that whenever we are, when you hear about discipline and problems with students, board members especially, please listen, uh, when, a, when a parent calls you, the best course of action for you to take as a board member to that mom and dad that's having problems with their son is number one, talk to the teacher. That's the very first place that you need to go. If the results from that is not satisfying to the parents, then encourage those parents to go to the principal of that school. And again, if the results are not satisfying to the parents with the principal, and Julie, please correct me if I'm wrong with this chain of command, uh, if, the, if, if they're not satisfied at the principal level, then you go to uh, Dr. Sprague at the administrator's office and talk to them uh, about it. And then obviously there is another step that you can take. And board members, that's where we are at that 30,000 foot level. We listen to it. Uh, if, let me just say it like this. If you get involved as a board member on the bottom level before it even goes to the teacher, if it is an issue that rises to the board level, I'm sorry, board member, but you'll have to recuse yourself because you was involved on that bottom level. Does that make sense to everybody? Same thing with staff. If there are staff issues, teachers, support staff, administrators, uh, there's the proper chain for them. If, if board members, if you're notified from a staff member about an issue, uh, take them through the proper chain of command. Don't give ear to uh, the problem or the complaint, the grievance, or anything like that. Because, once again, if it does rise to the board level as a staff issue, you would have to recuse yourself because you was involved with that bottom ground work. I hope that makes sense 
And uh, before we start uh, jumping into diving into this discipline procedure, this is not an item that's that's going to be voted on tonight. This is just discussion items. And I'm glad to see all of our admin building administrators here and a few teachers here tonight because we want to uh, dialogue back and forth with with you. You have some attachments on uh, on the screen. And as uh, as we go through and the administrators want to direct us to some attachments. We'll start with the high school level and work all the way down through the, the elementary school. And uh, let's just talk about some discipline issues, some things that we can do from a board to support all of the wonderful staff and uh, uh, the teachers and the administrators that we have. Is that pretty fair, what we talked about on, on Tuesday? So I'm going to lead it off with uh, Mr. Rogers and um, Mrs. Maddock and Mr. Moronk. Uh, they can start the discussion here. I just want to thank you, Mr. Pyatt, for for that kickoff to that on, on the direction um, that parents should go because sometimes we don't hear from them and they they go directly to the board or Dr. Sprague and, and I appreciate that working up the chain because then we have an opportunity to talk with them and explain the situation and the teacher does and that's just appreciated. Um, the high school handbook is attached and, and we had talked as an administrative team about just having bringing some clarity to some of the occurrences and some of the consequences um, in there as well as talking about some incentives and how we incentivize students. Um, one being, you know, we're talking about a, a specific study hall in that students with passing grades would have an opportunity to attend. And in that study hall, they would have access to certain things like the deck of dugout and maybe some games, um, different things that would they'd have a little more freedom of. And I think from the board level, you know, when those situations arise where that student isn't allowed to go in to that study hall, and if, if you hear from that again, you know, I listen to Mr. Pyatt's advice and refer them back to the teacher, back to us as the administration, but just understand where we're coming from as far as trying to tighten up some of those things in the high school um, with attendance, with behavior, and really trying to incentivize those grades. We're also opening up the uh, student, is it student in good standing? Am I? Pride program, used to be student in good standing. Um, the Pride program to sophomores this year is another incentivizing piece to allow students to leave for a, a period during the day if they meet certain criteria with their grades, with their attendance, with their um, behavior in class. Didn't we have that Pride program in the past? We had the Pride program in the past. It was only for uh, juniors and seniors. <coughs> And we want to extend that down because some sophomores are are getting their license too. And if it butts up, if their study hall butts up with something that they need to leave for, for example, come in later to work for one hour and they have a first hour study hall, then they could do that. Or maybe it partners up with the lunch period and they need to run errands or run home for something, they're, mm -hmm. they're able to do that. Um, right now we have a closed campus for lunch so students aren't allowed to leave during lunchtime. Um, and they would, so that's that's one thing we're trying to, that's just another incentive that we're trying to create um, because we need to create that urgency and some of those expectations for students that really they don't, some don't have right now. And that's one of the things that we're trying to improve on at the high school. Uh, we do have, and Dustin, I apologize, I didn't <coughs> share this with you earlier, but we, I did share it with you at 612. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple data points um, that we'd like to point out. Uh, Mr. Morak and Mrs. Maddock generated some, some data points, some graphs that we wanted to share, um, some positive data, and some data also of where our, our discipline is. Um, and some of our frequent events and what that looks like. Mr. Rogers, while he's pulling that up, I want to say that 
um, Monday, yesterday, in fact, Dr. Bardo and I went and had, and we met with uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Mrs. Maddock, and Mr. Moronk, had a great meeting with them. To the other building administrators, Dr. Bardo and I would like to come in and meet with you, similar to what we talked to them about, but I just didn't have the time to get to all of you before tonight. So be prepared, because I'd like to, uh, Dr. Bardo and I will come in and, and have some type of discussion, such like what we're going to see with uh, Mr. Rogers here. Uh, and the reason that Dr. Bardo comes with me, being the vice president of the board, is I'm not always going to be here for all meetings. There's going to be things come up. So I feel like that he needs to be aware of what's going on. So he tags along with me as much as he can uh, to go and meet with, with folks. He was with me on Thursday with Dr. Sprague, too. Uh, whenever we met. So he's got it pulled up. Let's, let's go ahead and see. As we look at some of these graphs, some of these data points, that first graph that you see up there is the percentage of, of positive reward or positive contacts that students have right now. So we have almost 74% have received a positive contact and they have about 26% have not. This data was as of last week Friday, right, Mrs. Maddox? Yeah. First graph is district, second graph is us? Okay. Um, at the high school, we've got 67.6%, .6 if you scroll down to the next one, that have received it, 32.5%-ish, have not received one yet. Um, we've still got the fourth quarter to go, so we're going to work on uh, boosting up that positive data. But again, this is one of those things that we do to try to incentivize that, you know, postcards, calls home, things like that. Scroll down a little bit, Dustin. Uh, this is our attendance rate um, for all schools in the district, but our high school is sitting at 86.7%, and we'd like to see that at least at 93% or above. Um, so we want to, in our student handbook, one of the things we want to do is incentivize that attendance as well. Um, and our senior class right now is... is the most, the, the class that's struggling the most with attendance, we'll say that. Um, as you go down that discipline by referral by incident, you know, the, the top one is defiance and respect by far, and then it kind of goes down from there with disruptive and electronic device violations as number two and three. And I guess that's just a, just an FYI, I guess all this, this information is just um, we wanted to share this just so it puts some context to why we're making some changes in that handbook. What's the time frame on, on that? The school year. For the entire school year, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Any other questions with that so far? And Mr. Moronk, Mrs. Maddox, feel free to chime in if I'm missing something here. So when we scroll down there, that's by location. Most of it happens in the classroom, um, and that's where the students spend the most time. And the other areas follow. So keep scrolling down there. And here we've got the number of, so the bottom number, that zero to one referrals, two to five and six plus referrals are the amount of referrals a student has received. So that 149 number is the amount of referrals that we really are aiming to decrease. That's that uh, six referrals plus. Can you define referrals? Is that meaning a behavioral incident yep, in a campus or a referral from law enforcement or for truancy or like? Nope, that's, this is strictly from our infinite campus student data warehouse. Got it. So um, it doesn't include any of the police referrals or anything. So it could just simply be an incident noted. Yes. Okay. Yep. It could be um, student had thrown out in class. Yep. Okay. Are we entering majors and minors in infinite campus? Yes, this is majors and minors. Okay. Um, Clint, um, because I was there when we talked before, uh, the 364 that you see at the bottom is that that is the number of students with zero referrals for the whole year, which is pretty close to half. 
and that next one is really one referral. And but, so that's when, but when we were there, we talked specifically about the six plus referrals. And one of the things that came up was the 1950s, 60s normal household. And you guys presented us with some uh, information about a lot of that, those kids that are in that last grouping, which 149. So I'd, li I'd like you to kind of just repeat that so everybody hears it. Yeah, they're just, um, a lot of those students are struggling with some good mentors, some good people that they can look up to. Um, a lot are male mentors that they're needed, but mentors nonetheless, just good mentors that they can have somebody to look up to and guide them and um, really encourage them and talk to them about some uh, goals and specific things they need to do to meet those goals. I think Mrs. Maddox tried to uh, recruit Dr. Bartle and I even Thursday to become a mentor to <laughs> She's a good some recruiter. of our male students. <laughs> She's a good recruiter. Do those numbers include special education students who have behavior plans? This is all students. Okay. Yep. And Joe, when I said that those didn't include police referrals, like if, if it was a really major incident, they might have received a police referral. But that, if, if it was at school, but that's only counted as one referral incident in that number. Yes, I, I define referrals differently, and I wanted to make sure that I was, my interpretation was different and clarify it, so you okay. helped me better understand that. Okay. You also talked about the transient family life for a lot of these kids, which I don't think are a lot of people in, Yep, some in are, the school district to understand. Some are, um, and I wouldn't say a lot, but some are moved from household to household, even within our district at different times, and that's, that's tough on kids. Um, the lack of consistency there, and it, it's tough for us too. The, I mean, we're constantly getting um, updates on this person is now at this household with this contact information. Um, on a fairly regular basis. Like I said, it's not a ton of kids, but it's some of them that that's another challenge that they need to, that they need to, to deal with. All right. A couple other trend <coughs> data here. Um, what you see there are, that is that graph and when it occurred, you see the months below so that Green number is the zero and one referrals on when they occurred. And then the middle line is that two to five referrals. And it kind of follows that top line, which is the six plus referrals. And that's just a timeline of when those events occurred during the school year. And then that bottom one is just by grade level, the number of referrals or the number of incidents by grade level 4K through 12. And a lot of those transition years are tough. Um, you know, you see eighth and ninth grade at the high school as being one of those, fourth grade at the <coughs> middle school as being one of the higher ones, and then kindergarten being a, a transition year that's, that's more challenging for students. Anything else, Mr. Morant, Mrs. Maddox? <coughs> Questions? So I guess I have some, some questions, um, and this is just, I think we, we struggle with um, when you said that we, you know, lack of consistency is tough on kids, especially when, they, when they're struggling with that at home as well. Um, and, you know, I think that we, we all want to see our teachers being respected. We all want to see our, our schools being a safe, um, welcoming place. Um, but we're not there right now. And um, I guess, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, how do we bridge this gap and you know, where, where is the disconnect? Because right now we have, the kids are running the schools. 
that's what's going on. I mean, you can show us all the graphs in the world, but the kids are running the schools. And, and I'm not trying to come across as, put, I'm not putting blame on anybody, but what I'm doing is, I wanna say is, I wanna work together to fix this. And in order to do that, we need to get to the root cause. You know what I mean? Like, where, where is, you know, I guess I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, you know, I, I don't know, like, what level is that, you know? Um, like, for instance, um, for example, if, um, Mr. Rogers, can you tell me, like, if a kid is in the hallway, what is, what's the procedure? What, what happens? If a student's in the hallway, like, they're starting to class and they get um, swept, which is we have different teachers going in the hallway after the bell rings, and if they are... Can you use the mic so that everybody at home can hear, hear too? So if a student's in the hallway and it is after the bell rings, then they're what we call, we do a sweep. So we do a sweep of the hallways, and we have different teachers, depending on when their prep time is, doing sweeps of the hallways. So if you would get swept, then you would be put on a list, and you would need to serve a lunch detention the next day. Okay, so what happens if they don't show up for lunch detention? If they don't show up for the lunch detention, then they get sent home. Okay, so that's what we're, we're currently doing? Yes. Okay. In all instances? I would say no but that's the protocol that we try to follow as best as we possibly can. Okay, so help me understand, when you say no, we're not doing that in all instances, help me understand why. Every single time, that does not get accomplished. Okay. Can but you... we're doing the best we can. Okay, help, help me understand. Okay, so help me understand when we're talking about consistency and making sure that you know, if we're going to be the stability in the kids' lives, if, you know, if they have, don't have stability at home, we want to be the stability, right? And if we're going to be consistent with things, how do we decide, well, this day we're, not, we're going to do it, and this day we're not. This we, student, we we're going to do it. We don't say this day we're going to do it, and this day we're not. Or we this student, it. we're going to, this student, we're not. No, we, if, if we know about it and we can address it, we do address it. And we've recruited um, certain staff members to help us do that. So I think we're better at that. Um, but we still got a ways to go. And we need to look, also look at our protocols and if, if that is the right protocol and if it's an effective practice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and maybe it's not. I mean, maybe that we need to have a dis different discussion. But we don't know unless we have these open, honest discussions. You know? That's, that's how we move things forward, is we have these... I'm going to say something about how we do those discussions in just a moment uh, right. going forward, but I, I would like to hear from the middle school, uh, from Mrs. McCann and Mr. Robertson, Robinson, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Robinson, gotcha. Um, just to hear a little bit what's going on there uh, in the middle school. So we do have graphs like that as well. We... We, Chris and I looked at them yesterday, um, and we can easily share that with you when we come and follow up. Um, but like you said, graphs are good, but like what's going on? Because the reality is not everybody reports everything either. We have to be honest about that too. And just working through like what does it look to make a referral to go into infant and campus? So there's a lot of training that needs to go into that as well. And I know when I first started, a lot of teachers didn't want to put a referral in because then it looked like they weren't doing their job in their classroom, right? So there's a there's a lot that goes along with a referral, just like being consistent. We as the adults need to have consistency. So when you see a term like disrespect and defiance, well, what does that look like to Miss McCann versus what does it look like to Mr. Mary versus what does it look like to our young lady right here, right? So like it's that's a definition that we've talked about for years. And we used to have like probably a hundred different descriptors that teachers could choose from. Well, that didn't really help us narrow down what the real problem was, right? So now we have narrowed down descriptors through conversations and, and really our, our PBIS systems um, have helped us figure out like, how is this equitable? How are we looking through a lens where we as the adults at the school can be more consistent, but it really comes down to 
defining what that means and then your values always fall into that as well, which we all understand. Mm -hmm. So that's where some of those gray areas come. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to be 100% consistent. Just like we all know, like when I grew up, I knew if my dad was gonna get mad at me, I was gonna get it, right? And my mom too, but like it might look a little bit different, right? So it's the same kind of thing. Like it's hard to get 100% consistent, but this conversation helps lend itself to how do we get more consistent? I really believe one of the biggest concerns is mental health. I feel, and we had quite a few of our staff go today, and I didn't get a chance to talk to any of you, but like they went to a mental health conference. And I really feel, without even talking to them, that this was probably a big topic. Behaviors. How do we help students? How do we help staff? How do we help our families? I work with Jill and different people like in our community quite often. And there are some really high behaviors that you can't just say, oh, this parent didn't do this or this parent didn't do that. It's, it's a village and we're talking about that right now. So there is, I love the graph that Clint showed about the transitions. Our hugest concern is that fourth grade transition. And we are struggling. We're struggling academically. We're struggling behaviorally. How do we help our students, staff, and our families in that transition. So in fourth grade alone, we, I don't know, I think, I think we probably had about four of our students go to another facility, be it through journeys that they met criteria or wherever they happen to be because their families, whoever their family was at that time, guardians or grandparents, whoever, and parents, they're trying to figure out what we can do. We're trying to all figure out what are some other places that our students can get the help that they need. Because the academic learning isn't gonna take place until they're feeling adept to handle their behaviors and, and emotional regulation. So I really feel we can look at graphs and we can take all that information. I, I feel like the biggest things that we're dealing with right now are defiance, disrespect, physical aggression is big. Like kids just, it's hard for them to even figure out how to have a conversation. They want to just lash out and smack somebody, right? And they think it's funny or they think it's okay, and it's not. And when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, most of them understand that at that middle school age. But in the moment, they just didn't stop and think before they did it. Um, and then another big one, I think recently, has been vandalism. A lot of vandalism in the bathrooms. Vandalism to chairs, you know, we put out things about TikTok. These kids are constantly looking at social media. We can't stay ahead of what's going on. And so, like, when I look at policies or when Chris and I have, have taken a look at some of the policies that we have, it's like, you, you don't, if you stick too tight on some of these, you're kind of locking yourself in because there's always something new coming up. So, like, what is the policy that could be taken a look at that then can be interpreted into a handbook that can be interpreted to students and families and community because law enforcement's a part of this too. So when, you, when you're looking at, okay, well, this kid should just get a citation. Well, it's not that easy. What's the age of the kid, student? Um, the police department isn't gonna like write out tons of tickets for students because that's that pipeline to prison, right? So like, there, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, I just really feel that number one thing that we should focus on is mental health. That's my two cents. One thing I really like is like she said a lot of things I was thinking myself. <laughs> I, I did write a couple notes. So like just because I wanted to make sure that I, she didn't touch on it, I did. So I heard root cause. I couldn't agree more. The only way we ever extinguish behaviors is by addressing root cause. So when the word consequence gets used, to me what a consequence is is a direct result of an action. So if, if I shake Clint's hand, his, his positive consequence or my positive consequence is gonna be smiles and we have a good conversation. If I punch him, maybe there's a different consequence, right, that's negative. So one of the things that we do uh, painstakingly is, is we take a look at our behavior referral data every week. Heather, myself, our counselors, our SRO, our social worker, our mental health navigator, um, and our behavior um, support folks, when they're available, they're, they've been kind of locked in and we look at behavioral data and instead of saying, how can we give more consequences to these kids, which consequences are happening, our, our, our efforts right there become, how do we support these kids, and how do we put interventions in? Jill's office has gotten flooded with referrals from us because we recognize 
that kids have an extreme need for mental health support. That's nationwide, that's statewide, and that's really exacerbated here. Um, if you've ever heard of the invisible backpack, the kids are coming with invisible backpacks that we have no idea what they are. So like that's something that we talk about on a daily basis as well. So I, I just, and, and I've, I've been a lot of places, I've done a lot of things, and one of the things I love to talk about is really root cause about behaviors and, and where they come from. So I always welcome that conversation. You guys have talked about how you can help us, and I've got a few ideas if you're willing to hear them. Number one, I see later on the, on the, um, on the agenda, you're going to possibly discuss some additional positions, including behavior strategists and family engagement coordinators. If you truly want to help us get these people in the door, approve those so that we can have extra supports to go and help all of our kids with the mental health that's needed. Um, another thing is, is, as you guys talk about what our Wednesday release looks like or not looks like, the Wednesday release is also a great time where we get together and we get, at least that's our plan, and we talk about kids and how do we better support kids. So that's just my, my two cents, and just, I'm going to throw that out there for you. So these things are all encompassing in how do we support kids and support each other on a regular basis. So if you'd like to talk more about um, restorative practices in the circles, like we could talk about that, but I don't know that we have that much time. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. I'm glad that you didn't demonstrate the handshake would have been okay to demonstrate, but not the punch in the face. I'm glad that you didn't demonstrate. We're going to move right along to Mr. Zams out east. Yeah, we have our uh, PBIS handbook uh, uploaded there for you also. Um, I guess the thing that comes to my mind is building a system of support. And we've been working hard on what does that look like? What does that look like at each level, at the elementary level? So input from our staff, school site, counselors, principals. How do we make sure we have a strong system of support to support students' academic and behavior needs? And um, we know we have a lot of work to do there. And we tweak that as, as we see <coughs> gaps. And, um, you know, it comes really, it comes down to those relationships in the classroom and especially for our youngest learners who need that routine and structure. And when we can support those uh, efforts in the classroom, we see some positive results. And then um, I would say too, just this year we've added a few more support staff and that has made a huge difference. When we can target, our, I don't know about target, but we can schedule them throughout the day to support students that need more at certain times during the day, it makes a big difference. And just um, adding on to what Chris was saying about those additional positions you're going to consider, those would be important. So um, we also have, it looks maybe a little different at each of the three schools, but we have uh, PBIS committees that meet, maybe look at the school overall, how are we doing, what, where, do, where do we need to go to address certain behaviors that we see are trending at certain times of the day. And then we have, um, within each grade band, we have meetings each month to talk about behaviors and how can we support those. So we bring together special ed, um, title, teachers, and we talk about those things. So. I would say we're on the right track. We're working on that system of support, and I'll pass it down if anybody else wants to add anything. Sure, Mrs. I can Smith. just add a little. Um, one thing that I also wanted to note was our use of our best screener, so our social-emotional um, screener that we utilize. That does help provide us um, interventions both as a classroom, as a school, as um, for specific students as well. Um, so it identifies like the top interventions for a student. And I would say probably 90% of the time is also that positive reinforcement and praise. So our PBIS handbook, our PBIS strategies that we work through really focus on providing that positive reinforcement. Um, and most importantly, that non-contingent reinforcement. So not necessarily contingent to a behavior. Um, so not always seeing someone doing something great, but also those, those I guess, drive by where you stop and you really identify and providing that explicit feedback, um, descriptive feedback for students 
really helping them to see not just, oh, good job, but really giving that explicit feedback. Um, as Tom mentioned and has been mentioned already, you know, providing those routines, um, relationships, structures, um, supports, not just for our students, but for our families, for our staff. Um, it's really important to work as a team. And I would say more so this year, last year was really hard with COVID, but we've been able to have families more so part of our teams again, um, bringing them into the school, meeting together as a team and really providing that whole, you know, we're all encompassed all together. We're in this together, you know, a team approach to support students and support families. Um, as it's been mentioned, you know, we have to get to that root cause. You know, whether there's trauma, whether there's, you know, as Kristen mentioned, that invisible backpack and really determining what the student needs, meeting them where they're at and providing that support for what they need when they need it. Um, I mean, it, it's hard at that elementary age. It's hard at all ages, but at that elementary age, like they're trying to connect with someone. They need that connection. Um, they're, it's hard not to give hugs. Like there are some students that I've honestly gotten a call on the radio that a student needed a hug and they needed it from me and I needed to be there for them. Like really being there for students, you know, whether it's as a principal, as a teacher, as a support staff, you know, really just being there to support our students and support each other. Thank you. Ms. Tashler, anything you want to add from no, West? I think Tom and Donna said a, said a lot, but I do echo what, um, what Chris and Heather were talking about when we talk about mental health. I think um, some of the things you'd hear about that our students have to go through would just tear you to pieces. And um, what we're trying to do is just provide that unconditional positive regard for each and every student um, using restorative practices like, like uh, Chris talked about, whether that's responsive classrooms, restorative circles. Um, everything, just like Tom said, is rooted in relationships. And um, we just need to slow down and consider their motivation, what their capacity is and what their skills are in the moment. Um, but I would say um, the students are running the schools because their needs come first. They drive every single thing we do. So yes, those kids do because they're the number one reason why we're here and why we do the work that we do. I want to thank all the administrators for uh, making the presentations and, and I promise you that I will get to all your buildings before the end of this month. Because uh, I just want to see what's going on. I don't know that's a that's a tall challenge, but I'll do it. Well, one last point: you heard of it's it's a multifaceted approach um, to to improve this. Um, but in your week in review, you'll see an article uh, written by Mrs. Maddock, and it talks about the seven mindsets curriculum um, at the high school, and that's our social emotional learning curriculum that really adds a lot of that relationship building piece. So there's a number of different aspects that you've heard tonight and I just, um, I think tonight it was good for that understanding of the totality in, in addressing a, a concern like this. So addressing the concern, thank you Mr. Rogers for segueing into where I would like to go with this with uh, the discipline procedure is what I said before is from the board level, we're 30,000 foot. We're not on the ground. We're not in the buildings. Uh, we're not. We're not trained for that. That's not our. That's not what our training is. If I was, uh, I would choose the elementary schools. As I told Mr. Zamzal uh, this past week, if I was ever be a teacher, I'd be an elementary teacher because there's something about those little kids that stir my heart. But anyway, besides the point, um, where do we go from here? Is the is the question of the night. So this is what I'd like for us to do. I'd like to give. Uh, uh, I'd like to give some homework to our administrators, and, and this came up in discussion with Dr. Sprague this past Thursday. And what I'd like to task uh, the, the administrators with, again, we're from the 30,000-foot level. We're not down in the proverbial weeds, uh, and that may not be the right terminology there. So what I'd like to do is task uh, various committees with uh, to go back and do some research, dig deep, dive very deep into disciplinary procedures, uh, the processes that are going on, because the board's responsibility, and Andy, you're the most tenured member of the board, the board's responsibility is make policy and hire the district administrator. That is our major responsibility. 
and listen to Mr. Prunty with the budget, obviously, right? But those are the two main things that the board does is make policy and hire the administrator. We don't get in the weeds with you. Uh, we, we help you and support you in the way that we want to do this is I'd like for the high school team, the administrative team, to let your teachers, your teaching staff, choose three teachers from the high school and meet with the three of you about this project, this disciplinary procedure project. So you don't choose the teacher because I don't want, I don't want a teacher to say, well, uh, they chose X teacher because they like them. No, let your staff choose those three teachers that's going to meet with you about the disciplinary procedures in the high school. Okay? Middle school, uh, Ms. McCann and, and Mr. Robinson, uh, let do the same thing with your staff, but two teachers. Let's choose, let the teachers choose two from your building to work with you. And I'm going to give you some more clear direction in just a minute. And then for the three elementary uh, principals, uh, you let your teachers choose somebody from each one of your buildings that will work with the three of you on this disciplinary procedure. I need a drink. Hold on. It takes water to run this windmill. Um, so the task at hand is this. I'd like for, for you to dive in very deep in um, consistency with discipline, uh, policies, administrative guidelines, and procedures. Where do we go from here? We have an, another board meeting, May the 24th. I would like for one person from each team, the high school, the middle school, and the elementary schools, to give us a, a little feedback as to where you have gone with diving deep into the disciplinary procedures. The board understanding clear kind of where we're going? You come back and give us a report on May the 24th. That report's not going to be more than five minutes at tops. And then come back at the next meeting on June the 14th, and let's hear how much farther you have succeeded in going deep. And what the board needs to hear is, are there policies that we need to change? Are there procedures that need to happen? Are there administrative guidelines that we need to look at and to help being consistent? Because the words that I were hearing was hearing from all of you is support, mental health. Where are some areas that we could, from that 30,000-foot view, come down and bring support to you? It's not for the board to dive into you and find all those areas. That's your responsibility. And then you bring it back to us, and then we'll talk about it uh, finally at the July the 18th meeting. That's whenever these committees will be done. And uh, uh, so, so there's your homework is to grab, not, not you choose, but let your teachers pick those teachers from your staff. Come together. I know you're, you have a lot of meetings, a lot of things going on. But let's see what we can do to bring some more help and more support. Is that, is that understandable? I mean, when I say, does that sound, uh, do, do I, am I sounding correctly? It's not because of your intelligence. It's because of my ability to give you what's in my brain. Heidi. What specific policies do you want them to look at? I, I just want them to look in general at policies that pertain to discipline. That Board policies. Board policies. Right. And administrative guidelines and board policies, because if there are areas that we need to sharpen, if there are areas like I think Heather said, we don't want to box ourselves in because sometimes we can. We can limit ourselves and really do more harm. So what can we do to bring support to the teachers? Because they're right there with those kids all the time. Not saying that you're not because you are there in the rooms. As we were bringing the cookies around, I happened to stop at North, and I, the only thing I could say to Donna was hello, because she was running, not running, but she was going quickly into one of the rooms to, I'm assuming, take care of an issue because of the look that was on Donna's face. But uh, So I didn't stop her. I just said hello and kept on going. So you're, in, you're there in the trenches with the teachers, but listen to those teachers that, that the staff is choosing to work with you on this. Are we going to be looking for like action, like measurable yes. outcomes? Th throughout this process, May the 24th, June the 14th, June the 28th, we'll be looking for measurable outcomes that's coming from those committees as you bring forth information to us. And then come July the 28th, uh, before then, Dr. Sprague and I will talk about what you guys have come up with 
and, uh, and we'll bring it to that July 18 meeting, and we'll see what we need to do to bring more support. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So I don't know what if they will have enough guidance okay. for what they are looking at when they're looking at board policy and okay. guidance. So thank you for a clarification. Maybe it makes more sense if you would like them to take a look at the way to start with their handbook um, that has been derived from policy mm -hmm. because that's what they use. Right. So Absolutely. So I just feel like that makes more sense than trying to go into board policy. They should start with what they have because they would do that anyway. Thank you, Heidi, for reading my brain. I, I was going to ask that too. I appreciate that feedback. I was thinking the same, and that's why I just was giving a look of confusion of like differentiating because the handbook should be derived from the policy anyway, but that's where you, that's like your, your I don't know. So dive deep, dive deep into your handbooks under the discipline procedures. That's where, that's where you want to look at. That's where I'm asking you to go to. And then that handbook under the policies for the discipline will lead you to the policies and procedure that are the board policies. So if there are board policies, policies that need to change, we can change them, but there's the process that we'll have to go through, and we, we know that process is there. Um, any other questions? Uh, I, I would say if you have... Um, well, can I ask? Uh, sure. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. It's May, and people are stressed out, so I'm just curious if we ask, we'll ask our whole staff, so, I mean, there's 100 people, mm -hmm. potentially, that we would be asking if we're including just teaching staff, which brings it down to 50. And if we're only choosing three and more people want to be a part of this, then I feel like they're not being heard. That's where I was at with manageable, a manageable team for you guys. May 24th deadline is not a finality by no means. It's like we just want to know, I just like to know where are you in the process. You know, a, a two to five minutes, this is where we are. We've met one time, we've met two times, uh, and, and this is where we're going. This is where we're looking at. Same way with June the 14th and June 28th. So the final deadline, obviously, is the July the 18th uh, to see where we need to go and uh, try to bring consistencies across the district, too. So if we have more than three, what's our process? Uh, if you have more than three, I'm going to leave that up to your team, your administrative team, but I was trying to keep it manageable uh, for the three of you to have very limited amount, because I know all 50 is not going to participate, but if you have 10 or 15, the more people you have, yes, the greater ideas that you're going to get, um, but it might be less manageable. So that's going to be left up to you. I just... Use your PBIS team then. If, if you've got that team already established that this, because I know PBIS is about behavioral systems, uh, use that team that's already established. And just dive deep into the discipline. Our teachers you, you just told them not to use that team. Don't, don't, you just told them not to pick somebody, not to have their favorite teacher. You said let the teachers. How was the PBIS, PBIS teams chosen? Volunteers. Yeah. Volunteers. Yeah, they weren't picked by the administrators. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Forgive me for not remembering the PBS teams. I, that totally slipped my mind. And I'm just going to respectfully ask that we push, we push it back at least one meeting. I just don't think that they're, they're going to be able to, in the next few weeks, thoughtfully be able to do this work because they are doing a lot of other work to try to finish up the year. All that I'm asking is for where's the start in that next meeting? Have you started? That's it. No, I'm not going to push that back. Sorry. But Mr. Zamzo, what you have not started is the deep dive that we're commissioning you to dive into to see if there's any policies that need to be changed, any procedures that need to be changed. That's where we're commissioning you to go to. Uh, not, not what you have been doing. I don't want to throw away what you have been doing, but this is a very specific dive in, into uh, what's going on because we know there's inconsistencies. We hear about them. We get the phone calls from parents. Uh, that says, did you know this was going on or that was going on or uh, it's there. But again, the board is at 30,000 foot and we can't go down in there uh, to see what's going on because uh, it's not our role. It's not our responsibility. It's the teachers that are there. It will take more than two weeks to name your team and, and let us know who's on that team. I think it's important that they that we open it up to other teachers as well. If okay. you can't find any volunteers to use the PBIS team, but if there's other teachers who want to get involved, they should be given that opportunity. And Good. I I just want to make a couple couple of points. And um, and I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it, and it's just gonna be blunt. And I, and I apologize, but I think political correctness needs to be done and over with at this point. <laughs> um, so we have done PBIS for over six years. Over six years. Where has that gotten us? Where has that gotten us? So we have a mass exodus of our teachers leaving our district. And we will have more and more leaving our district. More good teachers leaving our district because they are st stressed out, I mean, like to above and beyond their capabilities. You would not want to be in their, in their classrooms right now dealing with this day in, day out, day in, day out. And I'm sorry, but like, we can't have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and meeting upon meeting and then plan upon plan and then another meeting and another meeting and we'll talk about it some more and we'll talk about it some more and by the way the incident happened like a month ago i have two and reasons i'm not done talking and nothing gets done nothing gets addressed nothing gets done and the kids behavior problems don't they don't get fixed this is where we're at yes this is if then I suggest you go into our hallways. I suggest you go there because that's where we're at. And by creating a committee with teachers and asking them to come forward and say, hey, 
we're not doing this right. I'm writing up this kid, and I send it to the office, and the, you know, the principals and the, you know, the hierarchy of school authority doesn't follow through with what it is they're supposed to do. Oh, and by the way, they're the ones that do my teacher review, my performance reviews. I think that's not a good thing for us to do. They're not going to say anything. Would you? May I speak now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I want to say one Angie, more. I want to say I, one more thing. Oh, one more thing. Let her. Speak. President Pius. I want to say I could speak, so I will. Um, he I would also not said, want to see us without PBIS. Well, no, it does work. We have made so many gains. Um, if it's done right, Angie, she and I feel speak. like you're really painting a negative picture that just discounted what all of these people had to say. Teachers are trying every trick in their book. Does it work every day? No. Right. But what you are suggesting is that we're a complete failure when it comes to behavior. You show me a public school in Wisconsin that I don't has care about behavior. Other well, I'm just telling you that it's. I mean, we are not unique, but, no, but the staff we handle. have out there is unique. Mm -hmm. And I trust them, and they're working their tails off. We do make differences for kids. Oh, absolutely. But you didn't say any of that. So that's really insulting to me as the leader. Well, I'm sorry if I'm not going to sugarcoat things and talk about just the positives, because I want to move things forward and actually address the issue and have the open and honest conversations. Does PBIS work? Yes, if it's done correctly. What does that look like? That means that we, fo we redirect, we focus on the positives for the kids, but guess what? If they keep doing it over and over, we still follow through with the discipline side of it. We have not done that. We have not. We sit there and we talk to them, and we talk to them, and we talk to them until they're blue in the face, and it gets us nowhere. Nowhere. And what we are doing is we are actually hurting our kids because we're turning out, you know, adults that are not able to be good employees. How are they going to function in life? Um, and my last thing that I want to say is we are not even following our own student code of classroom conduct. Because when I, when I started this, looking at this, I thought, well, maybe, maybe we just need to, you know, lay out specific, you know, behavioral issues, maybe, th maybe that's it, you know, and drill down and lay out, you know, um, if the kid does this, then this happens, if the kid does that, then this happens. We already have that. I was so surprised to find that. It was created, it was adopted in September 25th of 2018. We're not even following our own policy. What What's the policy number there? You sold the Administrators can look at that. 5,500. Okay. Do we need to rewrite this policy? No, I don't think so. I mean, could we maybe? No. So what, we talk to everybody again? Because that's working so well for us. This Tell me the... how that works, Tidy. Tell me how that works. Okay, I'll, I'm going to show me the order. data. Just order. What we have done is we've created this, uh, this work for the administrators to do, and we're going to work through the process. Angie, uh, unfortunately, we cannot get from the 30,000-foot level. This is the responsibility right. of the board. Mm -hmm. So we cannot go down into the, into the level. No, but we, can't we, do have the, we do have the authority to change the policy as they bring policy information up to us. <laughs> Sorry. I thought we were going to have to call <laughs> McKenzie up here to help Andy out. <laughs> Uh, we do. <laughs> uh, we what, whenever they come back and say, "Hey, there is some issues that we need to," please help me and correct me if I'm wrong. There are some issues that we have uncovered by looking at all of this, and when they bring those issues to us, then we go through the process and change the issues. But we don't go down into the the weeds of the school district. That again, that is not the responsibility of the school board. And I clarified that with our school attorney. We stay at 30,000 foot level. The administration brings information to us, and we give information back to them, back through Julie, through our employee, and then she takes care of uh, all the administrators that are sitting there. Yep. Heidi.
I concur with what you thank you thank you Heidi I concur with what you said in fact I wanted to say to all the administrators I have always been impressed by all of you uh, my wife and family and I've been here 14 years uh, and and I've seen a lot of you on buses and going on trips and I've gotten to know a lot of you outside of this building and you're awesome you really are uh, do we always get it right no do I always get it right absolutely not there's one person here that knows I don't get it right all the time. But but she doesn't kick me out because I get something wrong. So we don't want to kick anybody out because they get something wrong. We want to support and uh, and bring some support. Um, yeah, I would just say it. I heard a lot of passion from everybody that spoke. And I'm very hopeful that we can build on that passion to the best support our admin, our students, and our, our parents and our community moving forward. So this is a little rough at times throughout this discussion, but I think it can be used in a positive capacity um, to pivot and, and bridge a gap maybe, um, build better understandings or stronger supports. So I think that although it is difficult at times throughout this discussion, we can use this as a positive pivot um, for progress. Thank you. Mr. Pyatt, yes, I sir. would just suggest that we roll this whole timeline back one one meeting. So not try and have them squeeze this in here before the end of May and then have our final um, presentation in August. So let's roll it to the 14th of June. That's what I'm suggesting. The committee of the whole meeting in June. Okay. If you have questions along the way, uh, please reach out to Dr. Spray. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be in your buildings uh, before the end of the month, and uh, just to talk some more about this chat and dive deep, uh, deeper into where where we need to go. Okay, thank you so much. 
I, I think this is a good direction. I like what Jill said. It may be some tough issues, uh, the tough things to talk about. Uh, but, you know, my wife and I have been married for 28 years this year, and we've had a lot of tough issues to talk about, too. And she still didn't threaten me out. Oh, let's move on. Uh, I'm, yes, ma'am. Will you be scheduling a Yes. I won't just jump in. I will always call and schedule what you're available because uh, I know your time is very valuable, and I don't want to ever impose upon your time. Yes. If you have better times, you want to let me know, uh, just let me know. I can, I can make my work schedule work. Item number J, uh, District Administrator's Evaluation Timeline. So um, in June, we are scheduled to go through Julie's evaluation. Sorry, I should say Dr. Sprague, please forgive me. Uh, evaluation process. And what I've, what I've done, you have two attachments onto your, um, onto your board docs there. The one attachment is the evaluation that we have been using over, um, Andy, what, the last four years? Five years? Yes, yeah. four, and it's, well, this would be four. So we've used it three times, but it's been revised based on board feedback each time. Right. So whenever I was looking at that, Dave, you can take one of those and pass it. Whenever I was looking at that evaluation, I, I tried to pair that evaluation up with, with uh, Dr. Sprague's duties and responsibilities per policy number 1230. Um, I'm sorry, not that policy. Um, hold on. What's the policy? 41. I think it's policy number 1400.01. So I took that, that policy and I tried to compare it. And, you know, I found that there were questions in the, the evaluation that we've been using, which we've been perfecting it over the years uh, through Mike and then through Andy, uh, saying, what do we want this to say? So I just thought, uh, the thought came to me, why don't we look at the job description that Julie has and base our evaluation upon her job description? Because there were some questions on the... Um, current evaluation that we have uh, that doesn't fit anywhere in her job description. So we're going to be, we would be looking at that, uh, that evaluation and evaluating her on something that she has had no expectations on. Does that make sense to everybody? So this, what, this other attachment that, uh, that Mary Kay attached today and that's me that asked her to attach that today at the 11th hour. I know that we don't like things being attached on Tuesday. I don't like that on Tuesday. So I'll take the blame for asking uh, Mary Kay to put that uh, second attachment on there. But you have the paper form, too, uh, of the other evaluation. And that evaluation is based upon the, uh, the job description of, of uh, Dr. Sprague. And I thought I had that in front of me. The yes, the 1400. And whenever you look at all of those questions, then I found policy number 1230, which is the duties and responsibilities of the district administrator. And when I saw that policy, I saw 17 items on that policy. And uh, I thought, well, can, can everything in her job description fit into the duties and responsibilities? And unfortunately, it doesn't. So I'm kind of in a quandary. Do we continue with what we have been doing and tweak that? Or do we look at having the performance evaluation uh, based upon uh, Dr. Sprague's job description? And I'm just looking for feedback there. I, I would support uh, the eval reflecting the job description. I think that most appropriately reflects our role as the board. Um, and keeps it's what's the word I want clear consistent it's readily available you know what your expectations are is what I'm trying to say kind of off that Julie are you given this ahead of time of what your evaluation is so I don't feel that we should change your criteria of evaluation after 
for a year, this is what you've been expected to be evaluated on. But going forward, what you're right. saying, Danny, makes a lot more sense, right. but I think that that would be mm -hmm. unfair expectations. Yeah, I, I agree with Kristen. Okay. Sorry, Beck. Anybody else have any comments on what we what we're going to do? Do we know what any other districts do? We actually have created, Trina, this current evaluation that we had based upon several districts, didn't yes. you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's been looked at several districts of what they do. Uh, there's really not, and I even asked uh, our attorney, Dean Dietrich, uh, is, there a, is there a set uh, evaluation out there? And he said, if that person would make that up, they would be in the Caribbean today. Uh, so there is no set evaluation for the district administrator. It's what the board sets up uh, for them. I, so I, I, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to tweak the uh, evaluation, but I, I agree that this is a little short notice. Yeah. Um, I got as far as reading how many questions there are here. There's a lot. It, that's her job description. Forty-seven I, yeah, items. Yeah. And that's good that. Uh, we put it into that, but I know one of the things we did uh, last year or the year before is eliminate questions. We tried to, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, we did more than try to. We did eliminate questions because um, it just got a little long. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually went through a, a like tally process and we eliminated redundancy. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as linking it to our job performance, it makes sense. I mean, job description, yes. I think Kristen's right that we just stick with what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. And then if we want, if the board thinks that we need to change it more toward the job description, that we do that sometime in July so that you're aware what's coming. So am I assuming correctly then that my eval will still be this summer? because I know we had talked briefly about moving it. Right, so the eval for this this past year up to June, we're still going to continue to do that eval. However, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna review your contract coming January, as per the state statute that uh, the administrators are always done through their eval by January 31st. So the, this eval that we're doing in June is based upon this last year's performance, but we will go back on track to the state statute and do your eval, uh, uh, do your review of your contract in January of 2023 prior to July the 31st. So will this be like there will be two evals, one here in July and one in January? No, this eval is taking, taking the place of this past year. The January eval would be just moved up from June of 2023. It would be moved up to January of 2023, where, where the state statute tells us to put uh, the uh, district superintendent's evaluation process. Um, the state statute only says have it done by that date, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. In, the only problem I'm going to have with doing it in January is that sometimes we do that evaluation and we have questions of Julie mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, she has to bring bring that back at a later date or get, it, get us more information. She doesn't have that. Right. And ja January the 31st is the cutoff for her contract. So I'm trying to tie the evaluation to the cutoff for the contract renewal or non-renewal. Yeah, I'm just saying that if that happened yeah. in December and we had questions, we would have January to deal with those and, and right. you know, resolve some of that. I know you like to put it as close to the deadline as you can, and I'm the kind of person who doesn't like to put things as close to the deadline yeah. as I can. Yeah. Well, we would probably look at the, uh, the review of the Julie's contract in um, the uh, committee uh, meeting in January. And then that way it's it's done before and it's not right close to that January 31 deadline. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just saying if that's an evaluation, I would like to see that in December so we had a little time. Okay. Does everybody understand uh, what we're looking at? Evaluation, 
we're doing the current year evaluation in June as, as needed. And then uh, December, we'll do the, uh, the new year's evaluation. Then January is whenever we will uh, discuss contract review. I personally, and I shared this with Dr. Sprague um, last year too, I struggled being a new board member, having one meeting in, and then talking about your eval and having to evaluate you. I didn't feel like that was fair uh, for new board members, and I equally thought it was just as unfair for you to be evaluated by somebody that could only evaluate you on one month. Mm -hmm. So I think by changing that moving forward, that benefits both the board and you, Dr. Sprague, and I think it's the most fair and appropriate to provide because each year there's an election, so each year there's an opportunity for somebody new to be on. And I just, my own feedback is that I felt very uncomfortable evaluating you, and I didn't feel like I had, you know, a fair opportunity to do so. Are you a fair opportunity to demonstrate your skills and abilities and to be fairly evaluated? So. Anybody else have a comment? I guess thinking about everything that happens in a school in December and in a school district in September, especially in the winter, I would say January, if not November, just because there's a lot that goes on um, within a school district and there's a lot that could go before. And I just think to be fair that January or November would be a better time to do it. That gives um, people who have been newly elected to the board enough time. We're into the new school year. But it's not too close to... Um, Make sure that if something comes up, it isn't fairly talked about. Anybody else? When do most districts do their... I, I feel like when we talked about this last year, maybe it was prior years and I was watching recorded meetings that, that it's commonly done in January in other districts, or did I make that up? January is when it's done most commonly in other districts that I have okay. found. Yeah. And I'm only familiar with WASA, which is the spring, like we've been doing. Okay. And I'm not saying we should do what, do or not do. I just mm -hmm. was curious and I, I couldn't recall where I heard or read that. So thank you. Okay, so Mary Kay, I think what we'll do is uh, bring this back at the board meeting at the end of the month, and we will we will vote which uh, where we're going to go. Is that fair to everybody? But just to be clear, we're still doing the evaluation here in June. Absolutely, yeah, we'll still do the eval in June. This is just going forward, and then we'll also, uh, if we're going to change the eval to match the job description. We'll also discuss that and have the vote on that, too. I know that's a lot of questions, though. Mm -hmm. Sure is. But she's got a big responsibility. Okay, uh, moving right along. Item number three, possible action items. Number letter A, consideration to approve overnight travel. I'll be looking for a motion. I move the board approve the following overnight travel, Anago FFA travel to state convention in Madison, Wisconsin on June 13th through the 16th, 2022, and Anago FFA travel to the Washington Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C. on July 11th through the 18th, 2022, and Skills USA to the National Championship in Atlanta, Georgia on June 19th to the 25th, 2022. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded uh, for the trips going forward. I did have a uh, conversation with Mrs. Domke, and she was going to change her schedule to be here tonight, but I said it's not necessary. I just caught where uh, for the FFA, three people on a coach bus, it caught my attention. And, uh, but we are partnering with O'Connell Falls. O'Connell Falls pays for the bus, and then we pay for the seats on the bus for our three students to go. And that's all paid for by FFA and FFA alumni. So I do want to thanks Ms. thank Mrs. Domke because uh, she was willing to change her schedule to be here if, she had a, if there were other questions. Any other discussion regarding the trip?
Okay, hearing no discussion, uh, roll call, please. Bardo? Yes. Borneman? Yes. Maddox Nelson? Yes. Matt Miller? Yes. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Yeah. And Pyatt? Yes. Okay, letter B, let me jump over there. Consideration of the Wednesday one hour early release for the 2022-2023 calendar school year. Looking for a motion. I move that the 2022-2023 calendar, school calendar reflect that Wednesdays would remain full school days and eliminate the one hour early dismissal. The district would then have four quarterly in-service days on October 28, 2022, December 12, 2022, February 20, 2023, and May 1, 2023. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, discussion. <clears throat> I would like to offer that everyone in this room and our entire community, in fact, knows that our primary goal is to raise student achievement. No secret. Research shows that teacher collective efficacy is the number one variable when it comes to raising student achievement. So many districts, and in fact, I had shared the Portage example with our board when we um, talked about this idea, built in collaborative time years ago. So here in Antigo, we strategize strategized a way to implement collab time for teachers without adding a burden to our families. That was very important. In fact, we were in, are in the middle of planning enrichment opportunities for kids for that last hour of Wednesdays. Um, I was pleased, um, President Pyatt, to see in your letter to all staff today in your email that you too recognize the importance of collab time. But yet tonight, here we are, and I'm just very concerned if this um, Wednesdays are taken away that we're under pressure, and a lot of it is put on by ourselves because we want to do better for our kids. Um, but if we continue the schedule that we've always done, we'll get what we've always got. And we had, um, a disruption in there. We had an idea that could project us on the um, a faster track to improvement. So I implore you to support our efforts to improve student achievement, which I know is your goal as well, and not to impede them with this motion. Thank you. So are these days, I didn't see that these days match up with um, when we're gonna have somebody from one of the CSAs come or anything. So what's, Amy, what's the professional development you're gonna be doing on these four days? These four days that are indicated were not part of the original calendar. Two of them are and two of them are not. So um, there's an October 28th day that all all CESA 9 is trying to do a little coordinated effort. We're, we've talked about do we join that coordinated effort with other districts in our area to collaborate. We did have the February 20th day, um, but the other two are not part of our original calendar, so. Okay. Do current in-service days have a set time for collaboration or is, would that be something new? Most times, yes. Very rarely is there no collab time. And do you feel that an hour, or any one here, feel that an hour would be an efficient meeting, getting together, is that hour going to be more beneficial than a set two hour, a set four hour period of time? Great question. We've talked a lot about that actually, and that's where, um, oh sure, I'll pass the mic. You said anybody here, so I yes, thought I'd just I, jump up. Partly because a part of my, my uh, role as the RPIC internal coach, 
Um, I've helped lead uh, our group on these discussions, and, and we've had a lot of really great discussions on this. One of the things that is very important in understanding what collaboration is, is in two forms for us. And what's called a professional learning community, which was celebrated by uh, Rick DeFore, if anybody is familiar or not familiar. What it really revolves around is taking timely data to understand what are high leverage practices from peers. So those collaboration times, for instance, our fifth grade team every other week looks at their fifth grade data on assessments that they created based on the standards they unpacked. So there's a lot of control right there with those teachers. So then they look at that data every other week and math and then ELA is the opposite of weeks. So what happens is, is if you don't have that data in a timely manner, you cannot adjust your instruction. So if your instruction is, if you get the data in, uh, in a quarter, you can't adjust based on that data. So it, it really renders their ability to improve um, a little bit moot. So the other piece of that is, is then our co-plan, co-serve, co-learn, where the intent is, is that we're proactively planning for um, lessons that are upcoming across uh, those collaborative teams, either uh, it's, it's with uh, content or even grade levels, um, where there's cross-curricular and cross-disciplinary lessons that they're planning to meet the needs of every kid ahead of time. So they'll look at their kids and they'll say, Johnny learns this way, we might need this, and Jimmy learns this way, we might need this, so that they're being proactive. Again, if it's only month or quarterly, or even monthly is a struggle at this point, um, then they're not able to have those planned and being able to be responsive to their data. Does that make sense? When yes, said, I'm just concerned with the one hour time frame. So that can uh, all get done in an hour. But we, so we have, we have a schedule built that it's not all of it at the same time or all of it on the same day. So to do a PLC, we do our fifth grade, um, all of the ones at the middle school are within about 45 minutes. They've become very efficient. There's been a lot of work to get there. Um, understanding the collaborative culture, understanding roles, bringing that data, they have to bring the data in. So an hour would be a great luxury. An hour uninterrupted time is gonna be really what's key in all of this. Because even when we have the time where it's prep time or collaboration time, um, and I'm, you know, I speak definitely for the middle school and I think the others can res resonate that, there's always that little something else. What's that little something else a kid knocking at the door? So that uninterrupted time in an hour is actually gonna feel like two hours, right? So that, that, is, that is a big plus. Uh, when does a fifth grade team, for example, that meets every other week, when do they fit that in? We've been able to carve out some of their prep time that is a, is a, common, is a common planning time. So they do it throughout, they, all of them have time that they have. Sixth and seventh grade for us is like their, the way their specials work. Like they all have the same prep time, that's easy. Fifth grade, Jason Fuhr and Heather have really done a great job on trying to get some of the time where there's all of the fifth grade or all of the fourth grade teachers have a common time. Um, and that's only two days a week right now that they have that we could use for that because otherwise it's like one teacher or two teachers have like an opposite um, special. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions on that? You see why I brought it up before, I feel really strongly about something like this. Thank you. You jumped quick. <laughs> Tim, can you tell me um, a little bit about the busing situation? Um, will, um, how is that gonna look? Sorry. Hold that thought, Ms. Smith. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we were gonna run the buses at normal release time. I mean, that's our intention initially. Um, you know, we're still, Julie and the team are putting together what that um, additional enrichment's gonna look like. And, um, you know, parents that wanna have their kids home early would be able to do that. Um, we're required to do um, bus the parochials at the, their dismissal time. So our plan right now is just to have one normal dismissal after enrichment's over, the kids can ride the bus home. Okay, so those kids are gonna, so we're just gonna have, no kids are gonna be on a bus early, is what you're telling me? Am I understanding what you just said correctly? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that's our intent right now. Okay, so the kids, all, basically all the kids are gonna be in commons areas? No, when we surveyed our families at the start of this idea during the winter, about 50% of respondents indicated that they would like their child to come home early. 
Um, so we need to find out if this works, um, depending upon the board's decision, how many feel that way, you know, in the summertime. But by then they'll be able to make a, a better informed decision knowing what is offered if my child stays. We have to have smaller groups. We agreed from the get-go, um, as I shared with the board, a giant study hall is the worst idea ever. We would never do that. And who's gonna be, what staff is gonna be, I guess, monitoring? Certified okay. staff would be collaborating and support staff would be working with groups of kids knowing that not all will be in attendance. Some will leave early. So we feel it'll be manageable. So the so goal. Right. So the collab time is focused on certified staff, Correct. not support staff. Correct. And that's always been the game plan? Mm -hmm. so what we for this hour. Yeah, for this hour. Obviously our support staff, especially. Heidi, can you come to the mic so everybody can? I'm sorry that I never asked you that before. I'm really loud, so please don't mind. No. So our support staff are involved, um, you know, especially the ones that work directly with students, whether they have IEPs or they're a regular at IAs. Um, they have a role in this, um, but we are looking at carving out um, specific collaborative time for them to work with their teachers during the day because they do have uh, information about those students to share with teachers so that then when those teachers go into their collaborative team, whether that's in the co-planning team or whether that's in the content level team, that they have all information. And when they create those plans about kids, then that's what's shared back to the support staff who are supporting those kids in the classroom. So they obviously have a role, um, and we're working with them to establish that role so they know their roles and um, responsibilities along with the teachers. Is there additional cost for us to implement a, the early release? I know enrichment was done when I was by phone. I had asked because um, enrichment costs were on one of the I think Tim one of your handouts um, so I'm just curious what the impact is on our budget until we identify clearly what they are what Tim referred to that day was with ESSER dollars available how nice would it be to have something really impactful for kids so in a recent meeting I know Heather and Chris talked about support staff already having um, like physical FIED um, type games that some wanted to run, others wanted to do arts and crafts sessions. But when we talk about cost, um, those are more the community partnerships that we're looking at. If we partner with the Boys and Girls Club, there could be a cost because it's an hour earlier. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, um, and the other nominal cost would be some support staff may have to extend their hours a bit later, um, which is okay as long as we don't get into over 40 hours per week. So, What would the staff to student ratio that be? We don't know yet, but smaller the better, so it's manageable. Some could be larger depending upon what the activity is. So some of the things you mentioned are current specials. Have we tried to look at a schedule where we could have maybe alternating weeks with teachers and specials and so we can do kids stay, do their specials and still have the collaboration? I understand it couldn't be every week all teachers. Yes, and I, I would defer to the team here. Um, I know they've worked a lot at um, trying to build this collab time in high school. Their schedule looks different from the middle school, which looks very different from elementary. It's no secret our elementary is um, on the negative end of the stick when it comes to collab time. Go ahead, Donna. That's one thing that I wanted to kind of just make sure that the board was aware of. At the elementary, we have a lot of shared special staff, whether it's shared between different elementary schools or we have you know, an art teacher that's shared 
at the elementary and the high school. We, you know, we, we have a lot of shared special staff. So we are not able to build in at this current time that collaborative time across a district um, utilizing our special staff. Now in the past we have been able to do that, but we've also reduced the amount of bi -ed teachers. We had three at that time, now we have two. So like we have to really look at that um, to try and see if we can build that in. We haven't been able to successfully build that in. So this year our elementary teachers only have 30 minutes once a month for collaboration across the district. So second grade only meets on the third Wednesday of the month for 30 minutes. They do have built-in time within the school day, like my North Elementary teachers, if I have three or two in a grade level, they meet as a collaborative time weekly, but not as a grade level. So trying to have that, we have, at the elementary, we have to have two layers of collaboration, both within our building PLC and our collaborative time, and then as our district as well, when we're working on standards work or any of that as well. Thank you. I struggle with this because I think the initial communication and survey that went out to parents was really unclear um, in terms of the context of what was being asked. So I think that survey provides some valuable results, though I also feel as though um, it may not be reflective of if additional information would have been shared at that time or prior. Um, would results be the same or different? I'm not sure. Um, I struggle with this because I know that our admin put a lot of time into what does that Wednesday look like um, and that they're in time crunches and scheduling and coordinating things and so I don't want to disrupt the work that has been done or is hopeful for and planned for. At the same time, I feel really unclear as to what that one hour less of instructional time is going to look like and I, that's, I really feel like that's my biggest struggle is what's the potential cost staff to student ratio, what, what is that, is it, what is that gonna look like for students? So I really struggle with this overall because I think there are entirely benefits to collab time. Um, I just don't know that I, as a board member, know what that looks like and how that would be implemented and that's my biggest struggle. I agree with Jill, that we would need more of a picture of what that looks like and more of a plan of what that's going to take from as far as a financial standpoint as well. Would it be more palatable if it were every other week? We didn't um, offer that at the beginning because parents and caregivers, we'd have to be really um, on with communication, not to mention scheduling would be difficult. Um, but it would be a compromise, perhaps. Honestly, I, I'm not, it, as a whole, I've never really been too excited about this idea. Again, because I don't know what it looks like. So I'm not against it. I just don't understand what, you know, how, it, how it's going to be implemented. I think if it's going to happen, it should be weekly because I think every other creates a lot of that collab time. Is right. that going to happen for our staff? Because they're going to be supporting students and parents and phone calls, and I don't think it's going to be productive. So I appreciate that the thought entirely um, and my, my feedback would be weekly if we keep the one hour early release. I just wanted to clarify, are you more worried about the structure of what's going to happen outside of the collab time or during the collab time? I just wanted to clarify. What's going to happen with the students during yeah. their collab time? I just wanted to clarify I didn't want to speak. Yeah. because um, I'll go back to what Chris said before, the reasoning when you talked about one hour less of instructional time we're not gonna have as many PD days because we believe that that was not conducive to raising our achievement by these one and dones. It's been done before and successful schools now are using more real-time feedback to inform their practice. And so that's why we, we as you know, experts in our field, we come together to talk about how are we going to really impact student achievement. And so that's why we're talking about the need for this weekly Time. I agree with you. I, it, to me, it defeats the purpose if we're not going to do that. Um, and as far as um, coming up with the, the what we're going to do for our students, even if all of them stay, I have no doubt that we would be able to manage that. 
here. I agree I that just, you do. I, we just want to know what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah, and I get that, um, but I feel like there's some level of trust in us that we we would need, um, that we are going to do what's best for our students um, and our families um, within that time that's given. Yeah, and I, I think that trust is there. I think, for me at least, I, I've heard a lot of feedback from families that are very unclear about what does this look like, why, how does it benefit my kid, this is now a cluster for me as a family, you are in the middle of my work week, the schedule's changing, it's not, the busing is still available. So I'm just, feedback from families is is that. It's a lot of frustration. And it goes back to the initial survey, at least the feedback that I've received directly. Um, back to the initial survey of, the, the survey didn't paint a, a picture of what it was asking for and how those results would be used. And um, Yeah, the, it was only one question. And it was, it talked about the why, which is important um, for everyone to know, to raise student achievement, and then um, that we didn't want to create those disruptions in schedules. So kids would be invited to stay the full day. And the one question was, if that is, you know, if this comes to fruition, are you interested in having your child stay the full day or leaving early? Um, and I was surprised at those results. The, I think the meat and potatoes, which um, that you're referencing, Jill, that will come when we can say all fourth graders, if they stay, have the opportunity to attend and we can give them options then when they're finalized. That's why it, it, that would have been too premature, but. Clint, what do you see happening in the high school? We have had numerous. For that hour. We've, yeah, we've had numerous discussions. And Heather, that. you're next. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose the elementary teachers are after. We've had numerous discussions about that, and um, I would just you know, refer back to what Dr. Sprague was saying. We're looking at some, some different options. I can't say these are the options that we would have right then. Um, we definitely have a homework assistance piece. We definitely want some aspects of uh, physical fitness games or um, experiences to be coupled in some kind of combination um, and offer some options for kids. And I'm not sure how that's all going to look, but those are things that we've considered. So oh. our, our support staff, um, just what the one, the support staff I've talked to, they just want some clarity on, um, is this going to happen, is it not going to happen, and if it does, then we need to meet and get together with some options because they have some ideas too about things that they want to offer. I have a question for you, Clint. So, has there been Mr. any? Mr. Rogers, she's got a question. For Sorry, you. I have a question for you. So Wednesday, that last hour, there's going to be some class that they're going to be missing every Wednesday, or how is the scheduling so, going to work for that? Just help me understand that. Yep, so we shortened all of our class periods. Okay. Um, because of the extended day where students would get out at 3.20 as opposed to 3.03 currently. Um, so we took that 17 minutes and spread it out as much as we can. Classes are typically at that 45-minute mark except for our first hour and our last hour classes are extended a little bit um, because of announcements that happen first hour. And then, so we take those and we shorten them up a little bit so they're in the low, the low 40s, I believe, um, as far as minutes go with our classes, but they still meet every day. Uh, feedback from teachers, we were, we entertained a block schedule, an alternating block schedule for those days, and teachers wanted the consistency of meeting with their students every week okay. on that class or on that day. Overall, what's the? I'm gonna. Ask, I would like the feedback from all three levels. What's the <coughs> feedback from your staff? Are they excited about the one hour? Like, what? How was it received from your staff to have it the collab time? Um, depends on how that's structured. Uh, there's a lot of requests for some department meetings where teachers can get together. For example, our CTE department. Um, I was checking to see if Mr. Prezik was still here. Uh, really wants 
that time to talk about some different targets and pieces that are affecting their whole department. Um, and they were very excited about that. Um, the PLCs have really caught on as far as, the high school is a different animal because yep. we have common planning time weekly. Every, every week on Tuesdays we have it scheduled. So today um, the PLC teams that I am responsible for, we had our ELA 11 team meeting and we had our geometry team meeting and they got together, they talked about their data, they talked about the instructional strategies they used and why they got those results and what they're going to do in the future. Um, so that's part of that, the power of that collab time. And that works at the high school level right. for, for pieces. Not the whole math department right now, it just works for geometry, I said today. So if you're on, if you teach geometry and algebra, you're on geometry this week, you're on algebra next week. So that is, that's a, a, a benefit to the high school schedule because we can arrange those um, prep times for teachers um, because we have a, a young lady who left earlier, Anita, who really just does a phenomenal job in, in organizing that and arranging that schedule. But the lower levels don't have that, don't have that time built in. You know, you heard Donna talk about some of the challenges with elementary and how they're, they're just challenged with 30, 30 minutes a month and that's just not enough time to, to be efficient and to have the purpose of those PLC meetings sure. really come to fruition. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. First, we want to talk about what we're going to do with students when they st if they choose to stay. So we have somewhat talked about it, but I told them to put it on halt because we're talking about this tonight. Um, but the conversations we've had would be we would keep our students per grade level. They would not really mix up. So fourth grade students would stay together. They'd have some opportunities, um, be it academic help and or some other enrichment. We, our goal would be to get everybody some kind of recess or time in the gym. We would rotate. We'd really try to figure out who would be in the IMC, who would be in the gym, who would be in the classroom. We have that space and we could utilize that at the middle school, which again, the elementaries probably would really struggle with that. Um, we also would want a snack. So we just feel like we could just really figure out a, a rotation where they, okay, everybody at the end of the school day, if you're gonna be here, you have to have a check-in process. You come to this checkpoint, each grade level checks in, and then we make adjustments for that. But we would have activities set up, but those activities would not always stay the same. Like we would obviously, yeah. kids get bored really easy. So you always have to change things up. And we would really try to bring in some community people as well. Um, but that's kind of the initial. And then we do have a lot of our students that automatically go over to the Boys and Girls Club. So we feel that fourth through seventh grade and then with the new teen center, we feel that that would be hopefully a good partnership as well. Um, but we're right at that mid age where we would have probably quite a few students sticking around, right? Because they're not gonna just go home and be unattended. We do have a lot of families that have grandparents. We see that at the elementary as well. Um, so that's really our initial stage is really kind of do extations and see how that works and then evaluate. Um, the model that we did last year with the pandemic on Fridays where students would come in and where the teachers weren't, students didn't come in on Friday, remember last year? So we're kind of, our IAs are thinking in that kind of model. Like we constantly adjusted and we came up with different ideas for our students that did come in and our IAs led all of that. So we just, I, I empower them to have great ideas and to come up with some things to think about. Are there some concerns? Yeah, well, well there's gonna probably be some discipline issues, right? Like that's, that's always something that happens. So um, you'd always have to get pulled out of those meetings. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at for if we do move in this direction. And then when it comes to collaboration times, we're similar to the high school. Like we're able to create that collaboration time during the school day, but I know one thing that our teachers want is they really, really like us not to take their prep time. 
and elementary is even more limited at times for prep time. We, <laughs> our fourth and fifth grade teachers really see the benefit of all being in the same building and being able to have these constant conversations. Like even just in the hallway, you don't have to sit down with an agenda to have these conversations, right? Like they're constantly happening. But again, that elementary is, that's kind of where that barrier is from what I can tell. Um, and our staff, the way we look at it, like we'll do whatever we need to do and we'll make it work. That's pretty much the attitude we have. So I haven't really hyped this up a lot just because I don't, we don't really know for sure. Are we gonna have it or not? Um, and then with our absorption of time, we, um, for fourth and fifth grade, they would focus in on ELA and math on those days. And that would align with what the requirement is like with our science and social studies. <laughs> so they need um, like 45 minutes twice a week. So we felt with that one day being out that our number one focus for fourth and fifth grade would be ELA and math and they would still have their specials. We would not touch any of their specials. Everybody would still continue to have specials. So we have that schedule worked out. And then we have what's called WIN, which is intervention. Um, and interventions are typically, um, we're good with having them four days a week. So we felt that would be fine because right now we use our Monday intervention as our pride lessons and our character. We wouldn't have to do that. We would move that. We're, our goal is to do like a morning meeting and have more of a, our, we're gonna move to the seven mindsets probably and more of that character building um, right away in the morning. So we would continue to have that each day, but that one day of intervention would be taken away on that Wednesday, but it wouldn't affect any of the fidelity of the interventions. So, and then the sixth and seventh grade, their time of their classes would decrease. They would still meet every single class and they would have specials, but their time would be decreased. And the lunches and recesses would all be the normal time. They would not be decreased. So we were able to figure all that out. So we're ready to go, whatever we got to do. Um, again, my biggest concern is the elementary. One thing I do want to say about our staff is actually there's a number of our staff in the middle school that were disappointed that they couldn't make the day off of the because they were looking forward to that extra time. So they value <coughs> the collaboration that we, we put forth in the process that's there. So, and Jill, I just want to, I, I want to make sure I answered your question directly about, you know, what's the staff feedback look? So they're, they're excited if they can use it in specific ways, um, but support staff was a little, was reserved about it because they, because of the uncertainty, I think, and that brought some, some anxiety because they're not certain of what they would be able to offer at that point. They do have different ideas on that. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure I directly answered that. I don't have a survey to say Correct. this many staff are in favor of it, this many staff are not. But. In the context of the question, it was more so this, I don't want to disrupt anything, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to intrude on the elementary feedback because it's super important, but I just that was the context of my, that question was you guys did a lot of planning. Your staff are excited or not. I don't know. Maybe a little bit of both, but what we do is going to, it could throw a huge wrench in any, everything that you've done leading up to this point. So that's why I was just curious on the overall feedback, excitement levels, just feedback you've received. So I can share on behalf of the elementary. Um, you know, it's really hard. We need we need collaborative time. <coughs> Trying to figure out when to have that collaborative time is really the hardest part. Is that one hour at the end of the day on Wednesday going to be, you know, the make or break? It's going to be much helpful. However, the one thing that I know concerns a lot of staff that I've heard from is really, if we have all of our students at the elementary level, we'll probably have a lot more, our percentage of students staying will be at the elementary because we want to provide similarity, you know, that structure, that routine. We want to have that transportation at the end of the day. So that would mean that we don't want to disrupt families. We don't want to have to have, you know, them pick up their students an hour early. However, that does mean that we would have a lot more students at the elementary. Um, we may have less support staff at the elementary. We also, know that our dismissal 
is kind of an all hands on deck. So will that also interfere with collaborative time? I'm being fully honest. Yes. You know, in all honesty, I think at the elementary, they were hoping that dismissal, that the busing and transportation was going to be at the early release. They understand, you know, staff feedback that I've received is that they understand like it, it would play a role, you know, in making it difficult for families. We don't want to do that. So it's like, how, what can we do to provide the best for both worlds? We want to provide that collaborative time for teachers, for our staff. We want to provide that, that availability and that location, those enrichment activities for students, for families to be able to, you know, have those opportunities at our building. But then what does that in turn look like? You know, is there a way that we could provide transportation at both times? I, I don't know. Um, somehow we have to carve out collaborative time at the elementary because they have such limited prep time and they have so many things to prep for. They're prepping for the most and they have the least amount of prep time, mm -hmm. which also means they have the least amount of collaborative time. So I don't have the best answer. I don't know what's best. I just know we have to support our teachers with providing collaborative time and we have to create that in the schedule. We can't expect them to do it before school and after school because there's so many other things that they need to do too. It has to be built in to the calendar, to the school day somehow. Do you think, I really appreciate that feedback by the way, thank you. Uh, <coughs> would there be any difference at the elementary level if you started, if the collab time happened the first hour of the school day as opposed to the last hour of the day? I'm thinking could you utilize breakfast time within that one hour collab time, I don't know, a more effective use of resources, kids aren't as burned out or weary at the end of the school day, I don't know, I'm just, thoughts and on that? Have ever thought discussed? about that with the principal team or discussed that, um, so I don't want to speak on behalf of, you know, the whole elementary, we haven't talked about that. I see your point of we could utilize breakfast, we provide students, you know, all of our students that breakfast, we really encourage all of our students, especially at the elementary level, to take breakfast daily. Um, you know, and we, we do have, currently we open our doors at 7.30, we provide breakfast until eight o'clock when our school day, you know, starts. However, we really provide it until the students are all arrived, so they could come at nine o'clock and we're still providing breakfast. Um, so I see what you're saying and, you know, that that's a great wonder. I'm not sure um, without talking to others and providing more feedback. I could see how it would be beneficial to maybe start collaborative time at 7.30 when, you know, teachers are contracted to, to be at school and then starting the school day at 8.30. But again, having that staff then available. Cited Hattie, which is a meta-analysis of research on the effectiveness and all of these fall under that as well as um, effective supports for student learning. Okay, are there any questions for Mrs. Doms for this position analysis review, number one. Are you asking, mm -hmm. the, or, I, I should say, what's being presented or voted on is, is the analysis itself or the approval to move forward with hiring for the position? Correct. The approval to move forward yeah. with hiring. So it's typical that we bring forward a position analysis to help create that approval or questions that may be brought forward. We do that for every new position. So is this position being caveated with like a two year FTE or are we just? Yep. So if you look at the recommendation on each of these, it'll say a very similar thing about that we add this position through the ESSER funding and then it would be reevaluated and in all likelihood we know that we're not only going to face financial um, downfalls because of not having ESSER dollars, but also just our budgetary position that we're in. So with all likelihood that they would be eliminated after the, the dollars for some of these, but we'd reevaluate everything, of course, as we would before any sort of cut. But we're gonna post them like that or we're not posting them like that? Well, I would encourage that we do post similarly for these because we even did that last year with our school forest coordinator, like letting her know that right now we currently have dollars for a position, but 
um, there's a potential that in, after three years there wouldn't be that possibility. Um, right now in education, however, almost all jobs are kind of up, up for stakes after every year because of budgetary shortfalls and situations that districts face. So. I just think that we should make it clear that it's ESSER funds to yeah. whoever's getting the job because if you're gonna uproot your family and come here, I just would hate to do that to somebody. Yeah. Right. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tim, can you, can, uh, I'm sorry, Amy. No. Tim, can you, I struggle with ESSER dollars mm -hmm. because I'm looking at long range stuff like construction projects, curriculum, mm -hmm. and this, so now I'm hearing that we have a certain percentage of ESSER dollars that needs to get people into the classroom to help. So, Doesn't just have to so be I, people. So, so I'm asking, you know, what kind of percentage of the ESSER dollars are we supposed to assign to these kind of positions? Are you kidding about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amy. So that's okay. Evidence-based instructional strategies, we are provided a list of personnel, things, um, strategies that you could use supporting monies to provide. So some of those are people, like real right now people to help with um, closing the achievement gap, assessing, er, addressing the long-term school closure, mental health supports and services. Um, some of them were curricular related. So a lot of the portions of our money can be used for that because that's also an evidence-based instructional strategy as long as we're choosing uh, materials that are coming from certain vetted resources, like What Works Clearinghouse and different resources. Um, but they provided lots of documentation. So almost every strategy and position that we've chosen on that overarching ESSER three document is an evidence-based instructional strategy. We'll be well over our 20%. Um, what was that? <laughs> He's just asking for the percentage, it's 20%. <laughs> and she Which told me. Which is what you said. <laughs> I think Sorry if I'm job. really talking too much. No, 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 you're not. Okay. You're good. So, um, yeah, we need to have 20% of our funds at least. So using our current terminology, how does this position differ than a coaching position? This is a person that would be supporting instruction in the classroom with the students, planning with the teachers, running small group instruction, looking at the data and just adjusting that instruction, filling More gaps. hands-on. Yeah, teaching kids, um, working with them in the classroom with the teacher, really addressing anything that we're seeing that we're lacking in that foundational skill development. Do we have current uh, standards set for math and ELA? Yes. Okay. All right. Tim, I just did, you know, it's 1.5. If we get 7.5, it's 1.5. So where are we at with all the positions we've added so far? Do you right. have access, Dustin, to a shared folder? Do you know? While they're setting this up, I think I honestly believe that in, in the value of this targeted support teacher, because of what we have heard uh, of the COVID loss of learning for those students of that age, uh, I, I do think this is this position is a very valuable one. I think it, I think it will go far. I, I, uh, in helping those younger students because that's where we need to catch them is in those younger younger years. I'm not an educator by no means, but I know you learn more quickly at that younger year than when you get old like me. Well, not only that, but after you get to third grade, math becomes word problems. So if you can't read, yeah. you can't do math. Yeah. yeah. Amy, can you tell me, if is there um, goals and outcomes uh, tied to this position? Um, or, you know, is there any kind of metrics or anything like that that will be expected? Well, our overall expectation with including these is to improve our student achievement. I have not um, written like the position descriptions perhaps about what the, all of the would do's would be. I was waiting for approval before I went to that far to, to write all of those because that would be the next step. But as far as goals and deliverables, we would want the teachers to be targeting all students to be able to raise their academic achievement so that they're on grade level. Okay, but do are we going to like list, you know, give some kind of metrics that we can say, okay, by creating this position, you know, this position has, you know, I don't know, raised 
you know, effect, you know, had an impact of, of this. How's it measurable? Yes, measurable outcomes. You. Yes, thank you, I was struggling there. I don't, I don't think you're gonna be able to measure that per this position because you're doing lots of things that hopefully are gonna measure. Um, well, it could be quantitative or it could be qualitative. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I mean, there, there's two different ways to measure it, but I think we need to tie it to something, otherwise we're just hiring to hire, it seems. I think I disagree with hiring to hire because this is specifically to target these age groups because of the evidence that we've seen in the learning loss from COVID. We've been tracking the group that was kindergartners last year and now first graders and we continue to see that they have deficits. So it's not as oh, though yeah. we're just um, making a decision based on a thought. It was based and rooted in data that we're seeing in our school district and actually nationwide we're seeing well, the deficit. So I think that we have an evaluation system for all of our educators and that's, they include data in their evaluation every year in an SLO format, which is their learning objective for the year and that's rooted in data. Like they have to show so much improvement for student populations and then they have their professional practice goal around how they're going to achieve that SLO and that learning objective. So I think our systems already embed that data piece for improvement right in there. Okay, so will, will this, um, position creates some kind of like a foundational stability to be able to help um, teachers move forward in the future with um, you know after the funds are gone <coughs> like we'll we'll be able to create you know systems and methods and to be able to help teachers in the future perhaps I think that I liken it kind of to how we have targeted support with our title staff or um, literacy resource teachers right now. Like you have an additional hand on deck to help with um, additional strategies that students may be struggling with to help plan for that differentiated learning in the classroom or what strategies they might need at any given time. It's a lot of planning for several small groups and we're seeing a wide array of areas that students need help, not only academically, but socially and emotionally and behaviorally too now. So. Um, to be able to help fill all those holes and help really try to bolster that universal academic so they are at grade level by third grade, that's critical. Um, so that they're on track for reading um, with their peers at third grade so that they can continue to achieve. So with any of that planning, you're always bringing new things to your toolbox and new strategies and you can use those in the future, but we're seeing a strong need for more support right now than we ever have. So do you feel like this is a better option than having an additional kindergarten, first grade, second grade teacher to have smaller class sizes? Well, there's a couple things with that. We don't have enough space for additional first, second, or kindergarten teachers in our buildings. So this person can help. And plus our class sizes at the elementary really wouldn't require an additional um, class, perhaps. But we could now that person can be in several classrooms in a day and help support the ELA instruction or the math instruction and not just one group of students. Whereas if you hired say just one teacher for first grade perhaps, they're only having an impact in one grade level or one group of students. Where this can kind of touch multiple, up to four, five or six um, classrooms in a building. So this person would essentially be in all three of the elementary buildings well, we're At actually asking for one per elementary school if we're able to staff that. Now, we recognize okay. that that might not be possible. Our hiring isn't always um, able to fill all of our positions. We do have, um, at North Elementary, we have a person who's in a similar position already doing that this year. We're seeing some really positive effects from that already. So we know that if we, we might not be able to get all three, we'd have to negotiate how that would look sure. and work. Right. It, within this analysis is a proposal for three? Yep, if you look at the top, FTE affected. It doesn't... The 3.0 3. is... Oh, okay. Plus three. Yeah. One per elementary, okay. You, you know, you I... Have, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I visited the elementary schools and I've gone into classrooms and I would uh, encourage you and Dr. Bardo to go into class, you know, when you go visit all these schools, don't just talk to the administrators, go in some classrooms during the reading period. And it doesn't take very long to see that, oh my gosh, we have this tremendous range of kids there. And 
for me, it's a little frustrating when the teacher's over here working with this group and the other kids are um, supposed to be doing reading on their own. And some of them are going through books like this, and some of them, I mean, they really crave to just have me sit down and read with them because um, they really get something out of the book when I'm reading it to them. Right. And otherwise, I kind of feel like they're looking at the pictures. And so I... Mm -hmm. I I believe that you know a lot of reading is just uh, somebody's got to read to you. You got to learn how to enjoy a book, and then slowly you want to learn how to read. And I think we've missed that with a lot of kids there, particularly in that first grade class you talk about. Um, I think they just missed a lot, and so they. I know our teachers read to kids, but um, we just need more of that. And it's, just an extra person there to do that for them would really push things along. I know a few months ago, whenever you brought the data about the decline with those students, uh, that's whenever my mind began to think, what can we do? And I think that question came up is what can we do to help support uh, these students that have fallen behind as a reason, result of the two years of uh, no learning inside the classroom? Uh, and I agree with you, Andy. Whenever I was at North, uh, Jill took me into Mr. Swartz, yeah, room, and he had four students around his table that he was reading to, and then the rest of the students were uh, on iPads, computers, and they were reading, and you can clearly see around the room those students that were involved and then those students who were worried, why are these two strangers in the room? <laughs> uh, but it was exciting because in his room, you felt excitement in his room. Those, those kids, Donna, were excited, and you could feel that in that room. You could feel the atmosphere. So I, I, I wholeheartedly support this, that, that we do need to get some targeted support teacher. And, and we're saying that these students have fallen behind as a result of COVID, and this money is coming as a result of COVID, so let's connect the dots together and make this happen. And, and the persons, the, the people that are hired for this position, they will know because of the posting that when the COVID SR dollars are not there, uh, their position could be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Amy, can you, can you tell me what the difference, and just help me understand what the difference is b between this and like a, a um, instructional, I guess, and I, I, I apologize if I'm with the titles, I'm still learning all these. So instructional aid, um, teacher's aid, um, okay. what's the difference? So this would be a certified teacher and our teacher's aides um, or our paraprofessionals, they will often take what the teacher has created and then a modified version and then help the student maybe do that lesson or support them in the classroom with whatever supports they might need. T the teacher is really creating and delivering the instruction to the small group of students or the large group of students. So these would be certified teaching positions, not instructional staff, not instructional support staff positions. Okay, so there'd be two teachers in, in the room is what you're saying? During a period of time, okay. not all day. It would be like, okay, I'm having my ELA block. I want to go in Mr. Mary's room at 9 o'clock. Now I'm going to be in Ms. Schreiber's room at 9.30, and then I'm doing different sure. strategies in each room to support th what those students need at that time. Okay, and Tim, what would be the fiscal impact of this? If that's our funds? Dr. Bartle's money, so that's going to yep. be whatever time I take over to shoot whatever button. Okay. So to answer Dr. Bardo's question earlier, um, this is a working document and we used it at a board meeting about a month ago. And um, Amy and I, along with the rest of the principals and administrative team, meet almost um, every other week to review the ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 year and all the, the, the funds. And what we learned from DPI is they want us to be spending ESSER 2 dollars first and then tap into ESSER 3. So within this document, we're tracking positions and how we're using the money um, by year. And then the, we total, um, keep a total, a running total of what we're spending and remaining unallocated funds with ESSER $3. So eventually as we add positions, we extend them over the three year period, we're gonna use it up. And so we're reviewing this We're reviewing this document. So Amy's pre presenting on positions. 
where we've had you approve the position analysis, and then when we get an accepted offer, we'll transfer those actual costs back to that first spreadsheet. And we're looking at personnel in the green box with some evidence-based strategies, and then potential qualifying <laughs> maintenance projects that once the um, items in the green box have been satisfied, will determine <coughs> how much we have available to do some of these projects down below. And um, if everything is checked and everything is hired over a two year period, right now, and, and again, since it's a working doc, I'd have to verify the actual numbers, we have 138,000 that would be available for, for maintenance projects. So that's the process we're using as a team and bringing those items forward to you uh, for approval. So if we were to hire um, <coughs> um, teachers, instructional assistants, what, um, what would the cost be instead? Okay, so um, I'll use the specific example of the behavior strategists. We've got two listed, I believe, um, in this particular example, we've got two, the two together would be 140,000 a year, so that's a $70,000 position we're estimating. We're carrying that on the other spreadsheet for a two year period, and that's how we're, we're working it. Good, Amy. Are you good at this point? Call a question. Okay. Previous question has been called, and I did some research from uh, Robert's rules, and previous question does take a two-thirds vote in order to uh, call the question. So, Mary Kay, can we do a roll call vote? This would require, JD, are, are you still with us? Yes. The eight. It requires a two-thirds vote or a consensus. No, sir. Previous question, according to Robert's rules, requires a two-thirds vote. Nothing about consensus. I'll, I'll, re I'll take away my, <coughs> I'll rescind my vote. I just want to vote on whether we're hiring some teachers. So I'm going to rescind okay. the call to question. I, I would just like to get going and yes. vote on this because I'm going to vote yes. <laughs> Does anybody have any other discussion? Mary Kay, roll call vote, please. Maddie Nelson? Yes. Matt Miller? No. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? No. Schrader? Yes. Bardo? Yes. Borneman? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. Okay, consideration to approve um, the next position analysis, sorry. Family Engagement Coordinator. I move the board approve the position analysis for the Family Engagement Coordinator as presented. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion is made and seconded. Discussion for Family Engagement Coordinator. So this one differs in the fact that um, what we are addressing here is outreach and service to special populations. There are certain families that we have been unable to connect with um, since the return of COVID. And also our youngest learners, we saw a drastic decrease when our schools were closed during COVID and the number of students that were attending 4K. And we've struggled to really engage those families. So we really would like a family liaison to help with that parent communication and also to be able to create some relationships to deepen the impact that we're having on that family engagement piece. A lot of our surveys that we give as self-assessments and reflections in our system ask about family engagement. We often struggle to have the community input. We've tried different structures. We've had different PTO organizations and CHAMPs, and sometimes we see some of those um, efforts kind of wax and wane with different times, and we're trying to re-spark that again but this person could really help not only with that communication, but then also cater to some learning that our families might need to help support their children and hear from those stakeholders um, and what they would like to see or what they need as parents or support for students um, in their best learning. So 
I've also, again, included some of the effectiveness um, in the connections to research as to why we would want to employ this coordinator. Um, and again, it's only in utilizing the dollars for the two years that the grant is available. Is um, go ahead. How many vacant positions do we have currently without including any new positions? I'm unsure. Did we <clears throat> talk a look? Uh, did, correct me if I'm wrong, but did we not um, spend, I believe it was $30,000 of ESSER money to hire the Donovan group to do exactly this? The Lori Miller from the Donovan group will help facilitate our strategic planning process, and a big component of that is family engagement, but the contract with her and the Donovan group wouldn't allow her to work here full time and um, on a day to day basis with our families. If that's your question, yeah. this would be an actual district employee. Okay. I guess I was expecting more from the <clears throat> Donovan group when we, when the idea was pitched to us and we spent $30,000 on that contract then. Um, so to me, I think we need to utilize that resource and talk to them a little bit more and see what we can do with our current um, employees and our current assets um, in partnership and collaboration with the Donovan Group versus hiring a new position. Um, I think that's better use of taxpayer money. That was so, actually my first thought was we have the Donovan Group that we are contracted with. They're very separate. I understand that this is hands-on. Donovan Group is hands-off seeking engagement, right? I mean, they're, so I was interested to see, I think there's a lot of benefits to this potential position, but I also think, hey, why not we, why not try one thing that we've approved to see where that goes for our engagement opportunities with families? Who is currently doing this, or are these all things we aren't doing at all? These are things we aren't doing at all. So these are new positions. That's why I understand it's a new position, but the <laughs> tasks that are being completed, we're just we're not reaching out to these families oh, at all right I see now. What you're saying yeah. now, I misunderstood your Sorry, question. Yeah. So right now we do have every day our teachers reach out to families, our principals reach out to families. We have some social worker that we're able to have reach out to families. This is really to target some of those relationships to build that learning platform to identify true areas that we need to support our families in, and then also really create that connection. Oftentimes, our systems are a little bit reactionary. This would be try to be more of a proactive approach to create the relationships and foster that earlier, as opposed to maybe when something else happens, we're being a little more reactionary. So trying to really foster that positive family engagement at an early age, and we really want to have activities and we used to have someone who was from like the resource center that was housed in the middle school that kind of did some of this work um, that was part of a community partnership and that extinguished probably about five seven years ago but where we would then um, take some of the feedback from what we're hearing from our families directly and then create learning opportunities um, really create those avenues for family input to be much more open and clear than maybe we have at this point. But it would be something new that we, um, I mean, we do a lot of these things intermittently without within our day in several areas. I mean, I'm now thinking of like our school counselors reach out to parents all the time and, you know, different, I don't want to leave anyone out because many people do a lot of little pieces of this, but this is really to try to like have a comprehensive linking platform. Um, there's a lot of concern around some of the families that we haven't been able to recapture or have heard from since the pandemic. And I know that seems maybe odd, but there's a certain population in our community that we haven't heard from families in months or more. And that's concerning. So how can we re-engage some of those families or help create those communications again? And the answer to your question is we have 20 
vacancies right now, but those are not all teaching, coaching, um, a total of 20. Are you saying that includes athletics? Mm -hmm. okay. So then adding the three be for 23 with what we just approved. Mm -hmm. So would this person take on some of like the planning the family nights and those kind of things, or have we not sketched that out yet? So every um, school has family nights that we host as part of our Title I family engagement portion. Um, we've done a really good job of boosting that up. We've had great success at almost all of our buildings, repeated events, and then sharing those events amongst buildings and families traveling from one to the other. But creating that consistent learning platform, we've heard in, in our exit title survey from last year and also from families wanting ongoing help in academically supporting their students and not just one-time events where maybe it's a little piecemeal together to really create some systems that we can have ongoing learning for our families um, in supporting them as really the first learners at home with their students. And Julie, the contract with Donovan, is that a one-year contract? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we utilized our one-year contract with them and I guess looked at what suggestions they came back to us with and what type of engagements they were able to cre create with our district families, um, Perhaps maybe th this position could be re revisited in the future, but right now I, I personally think we should utilize our contract with Donovan and see where that goes first. Donovan Group isn't about engaging our families in this direct way. It's about eliciting information from the community in order to help us plan our strategic plan uh, our, in our planning process. And so it's we've already got the information um, as far as where our families' needs are in our family engagement. Um, and so this is very specific to that. And the other piece of this is when you talk about counselors and social workers, we are understaffed in those areas in our district um, and have been. Um, and so the load falls on the teachers and then the load falls on the counselors and they're doing, let's say, social work work or they're doing family engagement work. And so this is another piece of the pie, even talking about going back to our discipline discussion. How do we build uh, proactively relationships with our families so that as they go through the system, they are a part of that um, and I hope that we continue and maintain this beyond Esther Dollars. There's no guarantee that that would happen, um, but at least it would help us to reduce the load on the other um, support staff that we have um, because we are understaffed in those areas based on the needs of our district. Have we looked at partnering with the county with the community case manager position, I think is the title? Yes, Jeff Yep. Um, they're trying to figure out her role as well because it's kind of this separate, um, I literally just got a letter from them saying we're not dealing with truancy anymore. Um, it has to go through uh, Steph Bossbender to help from that because the overload in the system at um, the county is, is that way. So we're still figuring out those partnerships with Stephanie, but she, she's directly working with families um, as well that have not been screened in is my understanding. And so. I, I, we obvi obviously we'd want to partner with her, but that's still growing because of the fact that that's a new position as well. So perhaps we could have a partnership collaboration with the county that's already working with presumably a overlap with the same population and, and how do we strategically partner together yeah. so that we're not, to, you remember not using this, we're creating this position when there's already a position that's similar, it's gonna be different, different entities as well, but I think we could, we have a potential to, those to are super build reactive. that. I agree with you, but those are super well, not reactive. Not if there's a partnership though, not if we're, so how can we work together so we're gonna share similar concerns, yeah. similar, similar demographics, similar resources, how can we work together? This position I think is truly intended 
to target those families that have not even been addressed in the system yet because they're such young learners. And so you're trying to engage the family and student in learning and providing those opportunities and trainings as they go through. Steph's position, our social work position, while we would like them to be proactive as well, because we're understaffed, they're very reactive right now, even though they're trying to build systems at the same time. So I agree with the partnership that we need to create, but I don't think that's instead of this type of position. I think this position is super necessary right now to, to capture, and the ESSER dollars are um, intended to try to capture back what was lost due to COVID. Um, and so whether it's short-term, long-term, or whatever, it's really a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. <clears throat> Anybody else have any discussion? Questions for Amy? Hearing no discussion, Mary Kay, could we have a roll call vote, please? on approving the position analysis for family engagement coordinator. Matt Miller? No. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? No. Schrader? Yes. Bardo? No. Borneman? Yes. Medic Nelson? No. Hyatt? No. Okay, moving along to item E, consideration to approve position analysis behavior strategist. I need a motion, please. I move the board approve the position analysis for a behavior strategist as presented. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, discussion. This addresses the area of mental health support and services. <coughs> that is one of the qualifying areas under the ESSER dollars and COVID relief funds. Um, so again, here we are asking for plus two, and the reason that we chose that was because we wanted to kind of target younger ages and then older students because the strategies would be different. This is a person who would collaborate with the student support teams but then also um, potentially with the teachers using our student support system. So earlier today you saw one of those support systems linked into the documentation from one of the schools. I believe it was the middle school, they had a flow chart in there. Uh, we do have a system for our students when they need support, but this would help to collaborate for more strategies and also individualize um, student needs to help um, that we see growing, growing needs in our school to help with this. Can you break, it, break down in simple terms what this person would do for students? So if I am a student who is potentially struggling to regulate and we've come together as maybe I've, I'm a classroom teacher, I've tried some strategies, I've consulted with my other peers, I've talked to my school counselor, we've tried different strategies to help the student, um, now we're going to bring more people into the team to help create some strategies and look at the data to help problem solve around helping students. Um, that could be one area. We also have our student support system where we gather data. So if a student reaches a threshold that they are moving through the system, sorry, I have an itch. Um, if they're moving through the system and they're showing um, chronic or frequent behaviors of a certain way, we bring together people to help support the students and create a plan so that we are um, but what, what is this position going to do, the specific person, position? So under the area where it says student impact and impact on other programs, they're mm -hmm. supporting teachers to promote the positive behavioral interactions and being proactive, but also it could be potentially reactionary if necessary to provide additional strategies and support. So if, if, a, if a student is acting out in a, in a classroom, they're going to come in and assist the teachers? Is that what I'm understanding? It might not be in real time. It might be in a problem-solving fashion. R so remembering creating more plans and more meetings and more, more layers is what we're doing. Well, as a system, we have to look at our data and support our students based on what happens in the classroom. So some of it is about a meeting and about a plan because otherwise, how can we all be on the same page to really work together to create something that hopefully improves 
for the students so that the behavior doesn't occur again. At some point, there's so many meanings and so many, so many levels that you lose effectiveness. So, so well, we have a, a system though in each of our schools for that mm -hmm. process. We bring forward um, student study team meetings on a regular basis. Um, so we have a system for that. Yeah, and by no means am I saying that you know I'm I'm all for helping the teachers and and helping our students and everything. I, I just I don't know if this is where I think it needs to be. <clears throat> so Amy, I'll be transparent. When I first saw this and I saw behavior strategist, my first impression was, no, Danny, you're not gonna you're not gonna stand on this. But then whenever I, I begin to hear Jill's voice in my mind, scary about asking all the time about mental health, mental health, mental health throughout the COVID. And then I sat and listened to um, Mr. Mr. Moronk and uh, oh, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers Ms. and Ms. Maddox this past week and I hear about so many students with all the anxiety that they have. <clears throat> and I see some of these students personally and I see a difference that COVID had an impact on their mental health. Uh, I wish I knew more about mental health. I'm learning as I'm listening to all of you, listening to Jill, especially with her, with her work. Um, so whenever I began to look at this and I saw this individualized student support available as identified within the support system in collaboration with the teaching, I thought to myself, this is exactly the support that a teacher needs to have. Even if it's short term for this, the for the ESSER fund dollars, it could help a student maybe get back on the right track post COVID. Uh, because face it, we know that COVID had an impact on more than just the sickness part, but on the mental health part. Um, I mean, I'm not afraid to admit this. My son is a junior in this building, and. Uh, I didn't realize until I really got to listening to him and his mother telling me, you better listen to him, um, how much of an anxiety issue that he has. And then when I began to listen to him and see this, I'm thinking, I mean, he's going to be a senior next year, but he would benefit from somebody like this to go in and sit down and say, oh, I need help. Uh, I'm anxious. I, I'm, I'm this because it was tough on our students mentally. Uh, we've all heard from board member Jill over the last several months since she's been on the board about mental health. Um, but I was, I was no, uh, but when I really looked at that, I began to think uh, this is gonna bring support to the students. And that's what I need to do is support the students. Uh, well, I appreciate, oh, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I appreciate you acknowledging your experience with um, a high schooler, but in our youngest students, they don't know how to imagine. some, yeah, they don't know how to use the words maybe to s tell us how they're feeling or why that's, you know, why they're feeling certain ways. So that comes out sometimes as a behavior or acting out. And it is hard always to come up with the right answers. And um, so having teammates to help you kind of you know, have a view that's not the classroom teacher every day, working with the student seven hours a day and kind of take that step back look and okay, I see this, let's try this and try to help strategize a little bit better. Um, like Donna mentioned before, we do have the best screener too, to, so using some data sources to be able to identify some areas but then help really put some things into place to help the students so they can, so they can achieve academically because if they're feeling anxious or scared or whatever it might be, they're not always doing their best learning. Well, and I just think like prices are going up for everything. Families are not done being stressed out about everything that's exactly. going on. And you look at our elementary staff, they don't have enough planning time. They never have, yeah, right. even prior to COVID. Um, and when you're the person who's supposed to be planning an engaging lesson for literacy with all these different levels and math with all these different levels and science and social studies and making sure you get the SEL stuff in, it's hard to come up with all those different behavior plans. So if we can have somebody, even if it's just through ESSER funds, and I get that we're gonna face a financial cliff, I totally understand that. So I think it's important that we advertise this position is being funded this way. It's a temporary position. 
after that, we don't know what we're going to do. But being that person who is coming up with everything for that classroom all day, I mean, elementary teachers spend hours after school that are never accounted for because they care. So having somebody else outside of yourself to be able to say, hey, have you tried this? Or to come and sit with that student and teach them that routine, right? Because we know that that's really what they need. They need to be able to learn those opportunities. You can tell somebody not to punch somebody on the playground, but then they go outside, they get mad, and they're second grader and they don't know how to express that in any other way, they punch somebody on the playground. Call them in the principal's office, they say you shouldn't do it. So being able to constantly teach those behaviors in those moments or go through like, okay, this is some of the things we could use. I think that's really important right now. Um, our kids are really struggling with that. And part of this is knowing, knowing that we have, um, <coughs> this is about capacity too, because we know that those teachers, um, the whether financial cliff, whatever. So while it's student centered, it's also about um, also having people from CESA supporting this person or whoever is hired with strategies so that they can equip our teachers to better handle when they do have to have um, those plans in place, right? So it's twofold because of that, because we don't have a lot of resources, we have to build the capacity of our staff as well. Yeah. When Mr. Rogers was up here speaking earlier, he mentioned that you know kids would greatly benefit from um, having mentors, and I I feel as though that would be a, a better use of taxpayer money to, would be to um, look at funding mentorship programs, um, and that could be you know utilized throughout the district, same as this, but. Um, there's also other grant programs that could be tied into that, um, not just ESSER money. So I, I... So ESSER funds are directly tied to COVID response. So these are dollars that are earmarked specifically for the needs we're seeing because of yep. COVID. So... It could um, be used for mentorship. Yep, and Mentor up program. next you'll actually see an opportunity that's very, very much similar to that with the Boys and Girls Club next proposal. So we have that coming up. Um, but I just want you to be clear, like these federal dollars were given so that we're responding to what we're seeing as the impact of COVID. So that's why we're bringing these forward because these are um, opportunities that we would hope to mitigate some of the loss that we're seeing academically, socially, emotionally, um, behaviorally, whatever those needs are. So we have discussed previously and we'll be discussing soon again that we're having issues hiring or finding applicants for the school counselor. Is this a similar position that you feel will be easier to fill? There's less uh, requirements. So um, licensing would, wouldn't be as much of a barrier. Um, we're kind of in a resource desert here, resources to support mental health and um, school counselors, school psychologists, those are hard to come by up north here. And um, so if we can have some people who are maybe less qualified but have a specialty area or a niche for some of these things, I mean, we all have gifts and there are people who this is their bag. You know, they're able to really identify student needs to help create plans, and, um, but they might not have a counseling degree or something like that. So a similar position. Correct. I mean, a school counselor does a lot of different things than a behavior strategist, but I mean, we're all working towards student needs. I guess maybe I wasn't very, I was thinking through your question a little bit more, but like a school counselor is really targeted on some specific mental health needs. This is more about um, supporting it within the classroom. I mean, the feedback that I receive routinely and observe and um, talk with staff about or just generalized feedback is we need more hands on deck. We have staff running, I mean, it's running on all the time with our staff members and they're burning out. And I think one thing that we haven't identified within this is, yes, it directly impacts students, but it's a huge uh, support to our current staff who, especially by this time of the school year, are highly burned out at behaviors or even worse with students because it's the end of the year, it's a long year and, you know, et cetera, not to mention the impacts of COVID. Um, so. The mental health needs are there. Ms. McCann spoke to it earlier as well. It's been echoed um, and I would ideally love to 
part two of this at another point is figure out how do we how we can, can be, blah, take two how to balance the budget so we can maintain this mm -hmm. moving forward because my bigger concern is this is limited time right um, but it's not going to address it's not going to fix the the problem we we will address it we'll make gains but that would be my bigger thing is Tim <laughs> <laughs> I don't need an answer right now. I'm not looking for Starting one. Starting already. <laughs> By tomorrow. <laughs> By tomorrow. tomorrow at three. No, I'm just kidding. Which is in two hours. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, Good reminder. Yeah. So, so I, I like the opportunity. I think our staff deserve that opportunity as well, or this opportunity as well for additional supports within the classroom. <clears throat> Any other discussion? I just think that with hiring these two positions and then also looking to fill the two um, school counselor positions. Um, I, I, I just don't know how that's, how we can be, keep that going financially. And I can see in two years that they're gonna, that they're gonna come back to us and say, we absolutely need to keep these and we can't, we don't have the money to. And so do we, we need just, to go down the road now and then we, they're gonna come back and then, then what? I think the conversation, and I could be wrong, really right now is everybody's being really clear, it's coming from ESSER funding and after that, the positions might be cut. And I think that's the same as the mental health grant that was out there, I don't know how many years ago, where it was a three year grant and um, people were told after this grant, your school counseling position could be cut because it's a three-year grant. Um, so unfortunately, people who are in school counseling positions or more of the people services realm have seen that before. Um, and I think if we're really open and honest, then we might have to come back as a board and just say, hey guys, we we're really upfront about this and I'm sorry. And Or maybe we say we can keep one or whatever. Maybe there's new funding out there. Um, but I would hate to focus on that and not, I mean the funding's there for that reason, mm -hmm. our kids are struggling, I hate to not give them that resource using that funding if that's the way it was intended. Um, if we're really honest about this is where it's coming from and this is how long we have the funding. Yes. Trini, I appreciate you saying that that in posting to be very transparent. With all of these questions. Yeah, that it's, that it's yes. uh, temporary. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Mary Kay, roll call please. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Bardo? Yes. Borneman? Yes. Maddox Nelson? Yes. Matt Miller? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. And that motion carries. Mr. President, as we come yes, up on the four hour mark here, I'm, yes, I'm going to take a little break. I don't know if anybody else needs one. Well, I was just thinking, uh, I personally would like to uh, use the facility down the hall. Uh, can, can, we, can we do five minutes, uh, board, and get back here? Oh. <laughs> five minutes yep. and, and go, because I need...
some Athlete and Blue Careers Reason Career Design from Coco? I actually didn't have time to read it. I was so sad. He starts it out like a funeral letter, don't you worry. <laughs> he said what? He starts it out like it's a funeral letter. <gasps> I was like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Yeah. I'm sure you can hear me. He's still watching. Um, with a heavy heart, I regret to inform you. My family and I have decided to leave. I'm your family. Really, you talked to Cooper about it. You just had a little heart to heart. Please tell me how he responded. <laughs> yes. And then with my both my wife and I flipping your career position. <laughs> I talked to Glenda asking about Oh, uh, tomorrow's my first day. I'm gonna be so tired. <laughs> tomorrow is <laughs> my first day I have to be at Bullard seven fifteen. Just, I did a consulting contract for 20 days. So from yeah. tomorrow till uh, July 1st. The, it was what's, it was in the best interest of everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, How long was your drive? 20 days. Also, the day that I was I guess they all sounded like McDonald's. They did. And uh, my sister was working. So I did until I could do everything the right way. But yeah, I'm so ready. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, fun. Great. Okay. I need the ears. Okay. So this is good. So, oh, yeah. she even okay. And and they have the same cut. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that just makes me better. Yeah. better. And having no, work no. You know, have you put me there? You were no. roller. No. Oh, sorry, I barked out. No, 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 no. Oh my god. No. <laughs> the only thing I took with me when I left it for three so years. So did you? Have, yeah, but not you. I had it on a sheet. Um, <laughs> did you know the? Um, uh, school board member who just passed? Which one? Gosh. Gross yep. I think, was his last oh, name. Oh, Jerry. Jerry. Yes, Jerry. Um, okay, let's come back to order. We have all the board members back in here. Okay. Everybody, please take your seat. <laughs> These are sensitive. Okay, so we are on the consideration to approve the analysis of the graduation specialists. I'll be looking for a motion. I move the board approve the position analysis for the graduation specialist as presented. I second. Motion has been made and seconded. Amy, your turn. All right, so in attending uh, the school finance conference this year this area is a huge gap in our whole state our high school students are struggling not only to achieve graduation because of covid but also again some of our students are um, missing and we can't really get in great contact with them we actually already have a graduation specialist in partnership with the boys and girls club what you see here is a copy of that initial position analysis and uh, description that was brought forward. They actually fund, employ, oversee, and hire that person. So in this agreement for a second one, because she actually is already over her caseload by a half, um, she's seeing one and a half times the people she's supposed to see. Um, we are not responsible for the hiring. They actually potentially already have someone in mind. We are just responsible in this case for the financial impact of the payment of the personnel. And so in partnership with those that are leading the club, Angel and Corey, we talked through, um, they do have a person that they have in mind and that would really help out our current person, Allie, and we would target, um, it's a research-based program that's out of UW-Milwaukee. They choose, students have to be selected for certain reasons. We have measurements, it's called the DUES score, so it's based off of transiency, failures, suspensions. Um, students are earmarked in a system to help identify students in need or at risk of not graduating. And um, she has 
more than enough on her caseload already, so we could already fill up half of another caseload and then we'd add additional students and keep them on track to graduation. We also exempt students who already have a case manager for another reason, being it um, a student with an IEP or the like. Um, those students already have someone, so we really try to target students who don't have someone already involved to help them kind of navigate some of the things to help them on, stay on course to graduation. Is this coming from ESSER funds? Yes. Yeah, it's not the same because this is the position from the club. So this, again, would be short-term limited with the ESSER funding. Um, again, we would not be resp responsible for the hiring portion. We're just financially responsible for the agreement. <coughs> for financially responsible, 100%? Or yes. Is this person an employee then of the district, or are they an employee of the, the Boys club. and Girls Club? So they're an employee of the club, but we pay them? Correct. How does that, I, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't know how that works. Yeah, that's, we have memorandums of understanding with the club for different things, and we understand. pay the club. We have other employee, like, relations like this? Like, I mean, I know the busing we relations. have, well, in the past, school. we have had people who were employed in our school for after school programming at the middle school. They were in the school building. They were part of <coughs> our school every day and had programming at the school with our, with our staff as well. Um, so this isn't okay. atypical that we've had partnerships like this with the club. Okay. I, yeah, I can see the partnership thing, but I just didn't realize that we were paying for these positions, I guess. We, have pay, we pay for different agreements with the yeah. club. So we have an agreement um, during the school day, we have some students who might go to the club. After school, we not only have transportation, but we also have an after school program that we partner with. Mm -hmm. um, they provide the staffing for that, but we pay them an agreement or a, a memorandum of understanding. And um, they use those funds then for some of the staffing costs, but also different things as well. Sure. Um, so what, what's the difference between this position, I guess, and then um, and I apologize, I don't know their, I guess, official titles. Uh, the guidance. The GDO 2? Is that what it is? The like an alternative call? ed teacher or? No, it, it, the guidance center. The school counselor? Maybe. It's, it's who the kids go to for <coughs> setting up their classes for the next year. That would be your school counselor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so they are a really good touch point. Your school counselor, they can help with a lot of things and keep you on track to some degree, but we're seeing even a more greater deficit right now because of COVID with students who have credit loss because maybe they weren't in school during COVID, maybe they weren't in contact with the school during COVID. We have a lot of students who are credit deficient, so to keep them on track and keep them motivated, this person directly meets with them on a weekly basis to create goals that they align to their graduation goals, post-secondary goals, and they check in with them weekly on goal progress. They might even be a liaison to talk with their families. Um, I know Allie, the one that we currently have in place, she's part of family meetings. If there are meetings at schools she joins to help problem solve, to help keep the student on track for graduation. So it's really a strategy to help our students who are at high school level stay on track for graduation um, and on that positive pathway. So what is the benefit of having them be employed by the Boys and Girls Club? versus us. I was wondering. Well, it's their position. I mean, then we're not looking to hire for that position. Um, they wrote the grant for the initial one, and we did not write the, the grant for the initial one, but we partner with them to have Allie in our buildings and working with our students. And that's often, a lot of these partnerships start in that fashion with the club where they might write a grant to help our students we provide them data to help select students and also the venue to meet with the students. Um, Whose benefits do they get? Do they get the school district's benefits or the Boys and Girls Club benefits? They would get the club's benefits. Okay. The current position, are we paying that at 100% financially? The one that's- Allie? Yes. No, that so is, was grant funded. So what we're doing is mimicking the success yep. of that position. Um, the club, I think it was more than just their, the grant dollars, I'm not sure that governing body that offered um, this to the club, but do you know offhand? Did you say UW? 
UW-Milwaukee? Milwaukee? Yeah. Okay, thank you. UW-Milwaukee. So we've had such tremendous success with Allie. There's just not enough of her, like Amy said, with 50% uh, um, more students than she should be seeing. So this is our attempt, again, using ESSER dollars because they're available to us to positively impact more kids. So it's like we're using their structure and we're only able to do that if we fund it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, you know, I just would like to share that all of these positions have identified COVID and the barriers and lack of contact with families for several weeks plus and learning loss and behind academically um, with, with first and second grade. I would sure hope that our district has will take a, a big look at the decisions we've made for two years specific to COVID and this extensive learning loss, loss of relationships, losing connections with families and make changes to any future decisions we make because this is significant. The financial impact is significant. The mental health needs are significant, not to mention the student achievement gaps as a result. So I'm just sharing that. We've just talked about how many positions all because of COVID and learning loss and increased needs. So I think in terms of um, balancing, balancing budgets and, and looking at student achievement and overall well-being, we should look at what our decisions were too and what things worked well and maybe things that we could do differently moving forward. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap my, wrap my brain around the fact that our, um, our upperclassmen our, and our, our seniors need this much, I guess, hand-holding, if you will, um, where they need to be met with on a weekly basis and set weekly goals at, at a senior level to graduate. Um, if they're at that, at that level, then we have failed, that was, we failed before COVID. <coughs> So you can't blame, you can't just blame it on COVID. We're, everything is blamed on COVID. And there's some stuff that, that was before. Um, it might have just um, made it worse, um, but I, I just, I think that when you're looking at classes and credits, it's, it's not a complicated thing. It, it, it really isn't. And I don't think it, it justifies hiring another position um, to figure out you need this many credits to graduate this is the classes you need to take this is where you need to be you know we can we meet with the kids monthly that's what guidance counselors are supposed to do so, um, I, oh, sorry I just one more, one more thing um, and I just want to mention you know we keep saying well this is ESSER funds well this is ESSER funds this is what it's for I just want to remind everybody, we can spend ESSER funds on other things. We have lots of other things that we could utilize this money for. You know, updating curriculum, helping, you know, Amy figure out um, what our district standards are. Uh, I mean, they're maintenance. I mean, look how far we are behind in maintenance. I mean, there are lots of other things that we could be using this money for. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that everybody's kind of, you know, on the same page with that. So that's all. Sorry. Go ahead, Andy. No, I just, yeah, Ellie doesn't work just with seniors. She's working in the middle school and the high school, correct? Correct. Right now she's seeing middle school and high school students. So she's really only working with three or four kids in each grade, maybe? I'm not sure of the, I used to know more closely which students she was seeing was I was at the middle school, but she, I can't say for certain how many per grade level, but she's seeing students at both buildings right now. That's correct. So early on, students are identified in Wise Dash, which is a data system that we have as a, um, a state that you can view some data on and a number of different things. But um, you're able after sixth grade to start seeing some, there's research to support that there's some indicators that if students are flagged in certain areas, they have a, lower chance of graduating. Um, and I mentioned some of those factors before. Truancy, um, transiency, 
uh, failures in classes, um, some suspension days, there's, and it's a formula that's put together. So we really look at that list, and then also I said, you know, take out those students that already have case managers because of IEPs. And I know it might be hard to understand. It's not challenging really to understand the formula of, you know, you pass a class, you earn the credit, but when you maybe were out of school and maybe working to support your family or doing different things and not doing school for a while, it is a little hard to get those habits back in place to get you back on track so that you will be ready for graduation with your peers. So um, sometimes that's kind of the mentorship piece. You know, they need someone to kind of help them, guide them along the way and keep reminding them, yeah, we're going to go talk to your history teacher about that. Maybe you're the person that helps them talk to their history teacher about their missing work because the student might not do that on their own. And I know there's some; those are some things that you might expect would just happen as a student is getting nearing graduation time, but that it doesn't always happen. We sometimes need additional support. What so. is the success that Allie has had uh, in the past with students for graduation? She um, hasn't had a lot of graduates because she's taken on some younger students, but like I said, they, she's really become an integral part of their success in the school and even creating those family partnerships. So being a part of the family meetings, um, she sometimes even helping families navigate outside of school resources that they might need or have access to for their students and future planning. So kind of connecting the dots Sometimes, um, you know, I think back to Heather saying it really takes a village. Like, I know some of these things seem very out of the box of maybe things that even I had available <coughs> when I was in high school, and that wasn't that long ago. But um, we're really trying to maybe it is that maybe it is that long ago. Um, really trying to think of all creative solutions to be able to help students be successful because we want them working in our community and being a part of our community successfully. And we know that high school graduation is a key piece of that, so. And in the, in the event that this does pass, I, I would like to jump on Trina's train uh, just to make sure, because the verbiage is not in this, if you want to call it a contract about the ESSER funds, before yes, this would be signed, uh, I, I would like to make sure that that uh, verbiage is in there, that this would be just because of the ESSER funds, and uh, it won't be carried out any longer. Correct. I apologize for that. I just scanned in the one that they shared with me. Any other discussion? Andy, you had no, something on no, your I, mind. I did not. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you just, just getting a little impatient being here, and I'm tapping too. on the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Harry, no other discussion? Mary Kay. I thought it was the Lord. Schreiber? No. Schrader? He fell asleep. It's the Lord. JD? He left. He did. He left. He was sleeping on the track. <laughs> He's gone. Bardo? Yes. Borneman? Yes. Maddox Nelson? No. Matt Miller? No. Mary? Yes. Hyatt? No. Uh, the motion fails. Right, Mary Kay? Yes. Moving on to G, consideration to approve additional school counselor position. And might I add, while uh, the motion is coming up, uh, just to help with the discussion, this would not be additional funding. Did you notice that note? As we would only hire two positions total, which the board has already approved. The funding's already there. Just want to add that side note. Now I look for a motion. I move the board approve an additional counselor position as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I just have a question. Um, would we need to find somebody to do the testing that the school psychologist would typically do? Or do we ha would we have that covered? Oh, that's separate. That's a, where are you reading that from? So we only have one applicant for social work position oh. zero for the okay, school so, psychologist. Um, so, a, so we do have, we actually have an interview with the social worker today. Okay. Super excited. Um, but I wanted to do this just in case to cast a wider net to make sure that we can choose because we can bring, I was told I said it 13 times, I think it was a pet cat in the room. 
sort of group um, the positions together because of the fact that we don't have sometimes uh, a counselor can do some social work where a social worker mm -hmm. can do some counseling. We have to cover at least, you know, like there's different ways. The psych position, um, we have done, um, it was one in the past. We need three based on our population. Um, but we have a very highly functional psychologist. Um, the behavior strategist that you approve would be able to support some of that psych work if we don't get um, another school psychology. So social work, we have it very defined um, in our pupil services roles and responsibilities, what those things should be based on PPI. And we review those all the time, the health navigator, all of that, because of the fact that some things you can do if you have a license and some things you can't do. Okay. So we're very clear and careful. Like our navigator, normally a navigator is hired. They don't can't do direct student work, but ours can because she's a school counselor. So we prep her. So I just want you to, I mean, we take that into consideration as we are hiring people. Um, so. We, and our student <laughs> population would be three school psych, but this is the first year we've had more than one, correct? Well, when I first got here, we had two, and then we contracted with a second, and then um, this was the first year we had two full-time psychs mm -hmm. since I've been here. It's been a while. Any other discussion? I'm just glad that Heidi had questions because she came to the mic. <laughs> and I like the word braid. That's good. I'm, I'm going to use that. They told me. Don't use it? <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> there's a story behind Braid. I'd like to hear it sometime. Not right now. <laughs> Everybody would kill me. Yes. Uh, hearing no other discussion, Mary Kay, roll call vote. Bartle? Yes. Borneman? Yes. Maddie Nelson? Yes. Matt Miller? Yes. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Pyatt? Yes. Okay, the next letter H, report of employee resignations and retirements. I'll be looking for a motion. I move the board accept the resignations of Cynthia M Miller, seventh grade language arts, Jessica Weaver, fourth grade teacher, Ryan Philbrandt, cross categorical special education teacher, uh, Ry Rihanna mm -hmm. Fubli. High school English teacher and Lon Ebel, alternative education teacher. Second. Motion and seconded for accepting employee resignation and retirements. Um, any discussion? Mary Kay, what is the date of that social for uh, retirements? May 18th. May the 18th, next Wednesday. If you haven't gotten your confirmation into Mary Kay, please do so as soon as possible. No discussion? All in favor of accepting the employee resignations and retirements, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Then it's carried. I will turn the proverbial gavel over to Dr. Bardo for item I. Item I is to reconsider the support staff wage schedule. I'm asking for the motion, and then I'm also asking for the person who makes the motion to read the next two paragraphs. I move the board reconsider the support staff wage schedule as approved on April 26, 2020, 2022, uh, by adding an adjustment prior to the CPI increase to the wage of the administrative assistant to the board and superintendent. And then the... Uh, so the change in the motion, so we need to read that also. Okay. Approval of the... Approved on April 26, 2022, I move the board approve the support staff wage schedule as presented with an increase of 4.71 in the schedule as well as the adjustments to classifications one and three and the behavioral assistant classifications four, five, six, seven, eight, 
8HC and the creation of classification 16, electrician slash HVAC technician, and recommended approval on May 10th, 2022. I move the board approve the support staff wage schedule as presented with an increase of 4.71 in the schedule as well as an adjustment to classifications one and three for the behavioral assistant classifications four, five, six, seven, eight, eight HC and for the administrative assistant to the board and superintendent and the creation of classification 16 electrician slash HVAC technician. Is there a second? I'll second. For the, uh, the people at home and in the here, uh, what happened uh, based on a meeting I had with Dr. Sprague was that in just what was all going down in the last meeting, there was one additional uh, move that should have been added to the original motion, and um, it was missed with all the talking, and so we're making it right. So any discussion? Mary Kay, roll call, please. Borneman? Yes. Attic Nelson? Yes. Matt Miller? Yes. Mary? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Bardo? Yes. I said to Danny I'd just keep going. Jay, confirm the next committee of the whole Tuesday, June 14th, 6 o'clock p.m., AHS Media Tech Room. Clarification, is this when we were changing the time? Oh, wait, no. Time is gonna be changed in July. Just kidding, take it back. But isn't the- Glad you're on your toes. <laughs> right, so it's still six o'clock until we hit July. And Andy's hoping it's gonna go quicker. Before we go for adjournment, I did tell Mrs. Krivishein, the secretary at the high school board members, if you're planning on attending graduation, please send her an email to let her know because they need to make necessary arrangements for that. So thank you very much. Oh, also, Mary Kay. I do need to see um, Danny, yep. Kristen, and Jill for signatures. Thank you. And also all the board members, I'd like to get, uh, I'll be sitting in shirts, I'm not gonna be here having shirts made for everyone. So I need sizes. Size. Where, where is this going to be at this uh, definition? Timber Haven. Okay. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> so move. Seconded. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, turn the lights off. <laughs> Party's over. No. No, my mom's in Pennsylvania. Okay. No, we're going to see our 40 month old daughter's uh, okay. latest grandchild. Okay. So we're going to be out there. We're going to fly down to this on the 18th, which is next Wednesday. I'm staying overnight in the hotel. So we're going to I don't take all and all tomorrow. So I'm going to be, I'm not taking the board. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. My